Tonight we are going to be hearing about the Higgs boson particle, the discovery of the God particle, uh, that's in quotation marks, mean the end of physics. And Matt Lowry will be telling us. Uh, uh, Matt is uh, a professing at the uh, Lake County Community College and uh, teaching physics at Lake Forest High School. Uh, okay. What you've all been waiting for. Matt Lowry. Yay! Okay. Let me uh, get myself situated here. My, uh, Matt, a little over a little bit more. Oops. There we go. A little over about a mother foot. It's in technology and science only. So. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, I'm just there you go. Hold this. Um, all right, so no doubt, uh, well, actually, first, before I get into my spiel about the, the actual talk, uh, I want to thank the uh, folks who run the College of Complexes for having me again. This will be, I think, my fourth time here. Wow. Right? Uh, so either I'm doing something right or I'm doing something really wrong. I prefer to think it's the former. Um, <laughs> The, uh, the talk I'm going to give is only about maybe 50 minutes long or so. Um, and if you have questions, if you have an immediate question where you need something clarified, feel free to let me know. Just raise your hand and I'll call you out and we'll, we'll take care of that. But if it's if it's a question that can wait, then just wait to the end. I have to move we'll this way to see the screen. Right so I hope um, I don't scare you. Here's my web address uh, for my blog. Uh, online I'm known as the Skeptical Teacher and other see, things. Yeah. And uh, in case you're interested in seeing any of my musings on science and education and skepticism and so on, you can check it out, skepticalteacher.org. My absolute favorite cartoon in the world, which I put on every title slide of every talk I do, if I can. And uh, so we're here to talk about the Higgs boson. WTF, what the physics, as I like to tell my students. Yeah, well, yeah, that's a nice little fun I see in my classes. Uh, they, uh, they think it's pretty cute. Um, now, the talk is geared to do, to address a few questions. Uh, first, in order to understand anything about the Higgs boson and the research for the Higgs boson, I need to give you a little bit of a primer on our current physics theories and how they fit into what's called the standard model of particle physics. Um, and then I'll talk about how the Higgs uh, boson, whatever that is, fits into this. Um, then I'll have to give you a little bit of a background on how particle accelerators work because, of course, with the Higgs boson and related physics, uh, it all has to do with the LHC, the Large Hadron Collider. Uh, and then we have, of course, the question, did we even really find the Higgs, the Higgs boson? Um, so let me uh, let me just ask this as a follow-up. And if we did find the Higgs boson, what does it mean? You know, uh, I don't know if anybody gets the reference. This is a this is a, a double rainbow from the internet. What does it mean? Okay, oh, okay, a couple of like that. Now let's just jump right into the discussion of uh, discussion of. Uh, particle physics as we understand it, uh, or fundamental physics as we understand it, I should say. Um, as far as we know right now, there are four fundamental forces of nature that we can study in physics. Uh, the first is probably the most familiar, gravitation. Um, we used to experience it, uh, we, used to, we used to explain it rather, solely in terms of uh, Newton's law of universal gravitation. Uh, but in early in the 20th century, a uh, gentleman some of you may have heard of named Albert Einstein came along and he reformulated the laws of gravity using a theory called uh, general relativity. Uh, the idea of general relativity is that uh, there's this uh, kind of fabric, if you will, that permeates the universe called space-time and that uh, massive objects cause puckers or dips or warps in that space-time. And uh, those, uh, those puckering and dipping of the space-time fabric causes objects to change deviation, including light. 
So that's probably the most familiar one. But for reasons which we'll come back to later, uh, in many ways this is the least understood, even though it's the most familiar. Then what we have is the electromagnetic force. Now the electromagnetic force, uh, it's a coupling of electricity and magnetism. Right? Electricity and magnetism are actually two sides of the same, uh, the same phenomenon. And uh, electricity and magnetism were unified in the late 19th century uh, by Maxwell's theories. And uh, this is also the force that explains the behavior of light. Okay? Because light is an electromagnetic effect. Uh, and so when we refer to anything having to do with light, such as uh, the quantization of light in particles called photons uh, and, and related things, what we're talking about is we're talking about the electromagnetic force. Uh, the electromagnetic force uh, is dominant on very, very small size scales, such as uh, atomic scales, uh, whereas the previous force, gravity, is dominant on very large scales. And for reasons which uh, we'll talk about a little bit later, this becomes kind of problematic. Um, you know, you'll see what I mean when we get deeper into the talk. Okay. Well, we've talked about gravitation, we've talked about electromagnetism, but now I want to mention um, forces that have to do with the nucleus. Uh, when you start delving into the nuclei of atoms, you get even uh, more forces that are, are dominant. Uh, the first is called the strong nuclear force. Now, the strong nuclear force, um, well, there has to exist a strong nuclear force. A lot of people really don't understand well, why we even have to have a force there in the first place. Because what the strong nuclear force does is it binds the nuclei of atoms together. Uh, so if you think about the electromagnetic force, or ele electrical forces specifically, like charges repel, right? So positive, two positive charges will repel each other, two negative charges will also repel each other. Um, and what's in the nuclei of atoms? Well, you have protons and neutrons, right? The neutrons are neutrally charged, the protons are positively charged, and what you're doing is you're packing them into an extremely small volume. So these protons that are packed into the small volume of the nucleus are going to repel each other with enormous force. So there's got to be something that would prevent the nuclei of atoms from basically collapsing apart. Okay? No. And that something is the strong nuclear force. Okay. Strong nuclear force is a very powerful attractive force uh, that is, uh, it's, it's, it kind of sets an upper size scale to the nuclei. Um, if uh, because what happens is, I can't remember the exact mathematics here, but the, the repulsive force between the protons that follows an inverse square law. Uh, I believe the strong nuclear force follows a law of one over uh, distance to the sixth power, right? So that means on very small scales, it's extremely powerful, but it's very short range. So what happens is you kind of get a fight between these two forces. You get the, the Coulomb force that's trying to repel the protons from each other, but the strong nuclear force dominates that. And uh, at some point, the Coulombic force gets too strong, and that kind of sort of sets an upper size limit to atomic nuclei. Um, and this is also the force that's responsible for wonderful things like atomic explosions, because when you break nuclei apart, uh, you, you, you're basically uh, breaking the, 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 the bonds of the strong nuclear force within the nuclei and releasing in vast amounts of energy. Okay, so, yeah. Uh, is the purported charge of dependence of the nuclear force related in any way to the Higgs boson? Is, is he related what? So so you said charge independent? The charge independence of the nuclear force is related in any way to the Higgs particle. Um, to get? my knowledge, the Higgs doesn't have anything to do with charge. To my knowledge. Yeah. Yeah, let, let me clarify something here real quick, too, before I go any further. Uh, I should have said this in the beginning, but I forgot to. Uh, I'm not actually a particle physicist, <laughs> even though I play one in front of some crowds. Um, so I do have a I do have a certain degree of knowledge on these things, but uh, it, it, you you may be you may ask questions where I just have to profess my ignorance. But from what I understand, the Higgs boson and the, all the associated things with the Higgs boson don't have anything to do with charge. Uh, they have to do with mass. Quick question in the back. Your system one femtometer. Say again? The distance specified on your chart, one femtometer? Yes, that's one femtometer. Right. Good. 
Okay, a femtometer, uh, I believe, is 10 to the minus, is it 10 to the minus 15? 10 to the minus 15. Yeah, 10 to the minus 15 meters. So that's why atomic nuclei are really tiny. Now, there's one more fundamental force in nature that we need to investigate here. Uh, this is the uh, not so originally named weak nuclear force. You've got a strong nuclear force, you've got to have a weak nuclear force. Uh, and the weak nuclear force is the force that governs a variety of uh, interactions within nuclei and between nuclei when they uh, undergo radioactive decay, for example, or when there is spontaneous emission of things like alpha particles or beta particles from, uh, from the nuclei of atoms. Um, it's a very weak force, hence the name, but uh, it's, a very, it's, it's necessary in order to explain uh, things like, okay, well, what happens when you have, say, a proton decay spontaneously, uh, or you have a neutron that uh, decays and turns into a proton and an electron, for example. Uh, and so it's intricately related uh, in, in all of those interactions within the, the nucleus of atoms. Okay, so we have our four fundamental forces. <laughs> Now we have to talk about <clears throat> something else, uh, which is important for understanding this fuller picture. Uh, and there are t this has to do with what are called uh, two basic kinds of particles. Uh, one is called fermions, and one is called bosons. Now, fermions, uh, for example, electrons are a good example of a fermion. Um, they are particles which exhibit a very specific property. Um, think of fermions like this. Imagine, let's see, we've got the holidays coming up, so I'll make a nice analogy here. Uh, imagine that uh, you've got a house full of guests coming along for the holidays, okay? And uh, if, you're, if you're a fermion, then what you're going to do is you're not going to have any more than two guests in any one bedroom. Okay? That's good. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, because the way that the way that fermions work is uh, these particles, such as electrons, they occupy quantum, they occupy very specific quantum states, and when they occupy these specific quantum states, you can have maximum two of them in any one state. So, for example, you can have uh, in a specific quantum state uh, around uh, a quantum shell, if you will, around the nucleus of an atom, you have. Uh, you have two electrons in that specific state. One is what we would call spin up, one is what we would call spin down. Um, but you can't get any more than that in that specific quantum state. This is one of the reasons why the periodic table of the elements is structured the way that it is with all of the s and p and f orbitals and all that stuff, as you may remember that from chemistry. Um, now, another example of a fermion are what are called quarks. And quarks are the the sub subatomic particles that make up protons and neutrons. Okay, so if you're talking about a a uh, if you crack open a proton, for example, um, this is a field of physics that's called quantum chromodynamics. Right, you crack open a proton, uh, what you'll find is you'll find what are called two up quarks and one down quark. Uh, if you crack open a neutron, you'll find one up quark and two down quarks. And quarks have this weird property. In addition to being fermions, you can't pack any more than two of them in any one quantum state. They also have this quirky uh, thing where they are <coughs> fractional charge, right? So if you want a proton, you get you get two up uh, protons, so two up quarks, which are two-thirds charge each, positive two-thirds charge each. Well, that comes out to four-thirds charge, and then a down quark is, is a negative one-third charge, and when you add all that up, you get a positive one. That's, that's where the charge of proton comes from. If you do the math on the way a neutron works out with one up and two down quarks, all the charge cancels. Um, and uh, so common examples of fermions are electrons um, and quarks. Okay? And that basically accounts for protons, neutrons, and electrons, the basic constituents of atoms. Now those are fermions. So we're throwing this word called boson around, right? As in Higgs boson. So what the heck is a boson? The boson, they're often, they're often referred to in physics as force carriers, and I'll, I'll give you a deeper summary of that in a moment. Um, let's go back to my analogy of the holidays, right? People coming over and staying in your house. Okay, let's suppose uh, it's like a massive sleepover at your house, and uh, you're running out of room, so you just let as many people as can possible pile into each room. 
Okay? If that's it, so in other words, party at your house and everybody's invited. Okay? If that's what you're talking about, then, you're, then th those are bosons. Right? So bosons are like maybe the uh, really annoying relatives that bring, you know, not only their kids, but their brother and their sister and their kids, and then, you know, they never leave. <laughs> so, uh, whereas the fermions, two to a room, we're, and we're in the analogy a room is like a quantum state. Uh, bosons, you pack as many people as you want into that state, or as many particles as you want into that state. And so on. Now, this, uh, this leads to an interesting aside. Uh, I don't have a slide on this, but I'll go on and throw this out there and kind of quiz you a little bit. Uh, how many states of matter are there? Six. Say three, okay. No, it's not four. three. Four. It's not four. It's not two. It's five. Okay. There's the three common ones that most of us learn about in school. Solid, liquid, gas. Uh, but if you take a gas and you heat it up a great deal, uh, what you'll do is you'll ionize the gas particles, and then you'll have another state called plasma. Okay? Called plasma. Anybody know what that fifth one is? So it uh, has to do with bosons. It's what's called a Bose-Einstein condensate. Okay? The fifth state of matter is a Bose-Einstein condensate. And uh, Bose-Einstein condensates, uh, what they do is they exhibit really, really, really strange behavior. If you take certain materials, uh, the one I'm thinking of specifically is I believe it's helium-2. If you take liquid helium-2 and you cool it down to what's called its lambda point, which is about 4.2 degrees Kelvin, 4.2 degrees above absolute zero, uh, that liquid helium-2 enters what's called a Bose-Einstein condensate, where every atom of that material enters exactly the same quantum state. Okay, so what? Well, it ends up that when that happens, the, the liquid helium-2 exhibits very, very strange behavior, which is called superfluidity. And if you want to get an idea of what I'm talking about when I say strange behavior, just get onto YouTube uh, and just type in superfluidity or superfluids. Um, these things do stuff like if you have... If you have like a, a jug of this stuff and you disturb it, it'll climb up over the sides. Yeah, yeah. Without really having to like pour it, it just climbs up over the sides. Um, and they have zero viscosity, no internal viscosity or resistance to motion. They're, so once you start to get them rotating, they just keep rotating. They're essentially frictionless. Uh, it's very interesting stuff. Um, so that's just a quick aside on the whole boson thing. Now, why are bosons called force carrying particles? They're force carriers because when we talked about the four fundamental forces, right, gravity, electromagnetism, strong and weak nuclear force, um, in particle physics, the way that it's looked at is uh, if you're going to have two things interact, like for example, you have uh, two electrical circuits interact by Wi Fi, for example. Well, that's using the electromagnetic force or the electromagnetic field. And essentially what's happening is you're transmitting photons back and forth, right? So the, we would call those photons, uh, what sometimes people call them radio waves, uh, we would call those radio photons the force carrier. They, 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 they are responsible for sort of carrying that interaction between those two things. So photons are the mediating particle between uh, electrical charges. Um, for the weak nuclear force, the mediating force carrying particle is called, uh, they're called W and B, oh, sorry, W and Z gauge bosons. Uh, and then when you're talking about looking at the inside of protons and neutrons, right, where the quarks are, the, the particle that mediates the force between the quarks within protons and neutrons is called a gluon. Okay. Um, so there's that. Now, so what? What does all this mean? Well. When we summarize all this stuff, right, when we start talking about the leptons, the bosons, uh, you know, quarks, the electrons, force carrying particles, all of this stuff, when you put it all together, you get a picture like this. And uh, when you look at this, I want you to think of this kind of like, uh, okay, this is kind of like a periodic table, but for fundamental particle physics, right? So the way the periodic table for chemistry is structured, 
it, it, you, you have very specific kinds of behavior and, and, and properties for each row and column and so on. This is kind of the same thing, but for fundamental particle physics. Does anybody know what this picture is called? This is the standard model. Greek. This is, yeah. this is the standard model of particle physics. Yeah, maybe there's some Greek right here, right? Yeah. Uh, this is the standard model of particle physics. Now, let me, let me kind of explain to you what this is all about, okay? What we have is in the purple, these are the quarks. It ends up that there are actually six different kinds of quarks in the standard model. Uh, I only mentioned two of the up and down quark, but six, have been, six were predicted by the, by the theory, and so far all six have been discovered. Uh, there's the up charm, top, down, strange, and bottom quark. And people look at quarks and they say, why are they given such weird names? And that's because the person who came up with the theory of quantum chromodynamics, Murray Gelman, is a very quirky physicist and he just liked the names. So you come up with a theory, you get to make stuff up and call it what you want. Um, down here in the green, we have leptons, which are a variety, which are a kind of fermion, right? That's where you get the uh, our familiar friend, the electron, uh, and some other fundamental particles such as muons and tau particles, and these other things called neutrinos, of which there's a variety. The blue column here, those are the bosons. Those are the force-carrying particles that we just talked about, right? So you have the photon right here, mediates the electromagnetic force. You have the gluon, which mediates the strong nuclear force. And you have the W and Z bosons, which mediate the weak nuclear force. Now, before I go any further, let me ask you guys a question. Something important is missing here. What is it? Gravity. Gravity, exactly. Gravity is missing. One of our big mysteries in physics is how does gravity fit, if at all, into the standard model? And the answer to that is we have no idea. We do not know. There's supposed to be a force carrying particle for every fundamental force, right? But gravity is not part of this picture. Okay, we, uh, hypothetically, there's supposed to be a, a particle which mediates the gravitational force called a graviton, but we've never discovered it. And we don't have a coherent theory that can make a graviton type particle fit into this yet. I don't know if we'll be able to do that, but uh, we'll see. Okay, so this is all background. Everything we've been talking about the last 20, 25 minutes is all background. So, what does this have anything to do with the Higgs boson or the real topic of this talk? Well, here's what it has to do with the basic structure and theory behind all of this um, hinges upon what's called the Higgs mechanism. Okay, Now the Higgs mechanism uh, is supposed to be this interaction which gives, the bit, which gives all of these particles uh, their basic properties in terms of the mass. Okay, So why, are elect why do electrons have the mass that they do? Why do quarks have the masses that they do? The idea is that the Higgs, the Higgs is supposed to address that. And the Higgs was predicted, was predicted many, many decades ago. Okay? And so the idea is if we look for this thing called the Higgs particle or the Higgs boson, uh, then what you're gonna, if you do find it, then that's evidence that, yeah, we're on the right track with this. If you don't find it, that means that we gotta maybe get rid of this and find something better. Okay. Now, there are, there's some confusion about the Higgs boson, right? So here's my, oops, I should have had this slide up. Um, let me make this a little bit smaller or I'll move it over or something. Okay, now the Higgs boson, um, like I said, it, it, it would predict why they all have their masses and why the structure of the standard model is what it is. Uh, and this little guy right here, you know, I, have to, I have to show I brought props. Uh, when people ask if we found the Higgs boson, I like to joke, yeah, well, here it is, right? Um, this is a, uh, this is just a cute little plush. Uh, this is a, a little Higgs boson plush from a place called ParticleZoo.net. If you're a physics geek like me, uh, then you'll love ParticleZoo.net. They have, they have little plushes like this for every particle you can think of. There's a little tachyon one that is supposed to move faster than light, so it's shaped like a little arrow and it's right? Uh, and then there's the Higgs. And, the Higgs, uh, for those of you who understand at least a little bit of physics, if you want to, you can come and pick this up. You'll feel he's pretty heavy. Uh, okay. Uh, that's, that's another physics joke. Higgs particles are supposed to be very, very massive. 
Uh, we'll get into that in a little bit. Um, so if you have a physics geek in your life, go get them something for the holidays and they'll, they'll enjoy it. Um, but there is some confusion with terminology here, so we need to be very clear about a few things. Okay, so we've got the various parts of the standard model, and then there's this thing called the Higgs boson, and then you may have heard of something called the Higgs field. Okay, how many of you have heard of both the Higgs boson and the Higgs field? Raise your hand. Okay, uh, how many of you have just heard about the Higgs boson? And you don't have any idea what the Higgs field is, you've never even heard that. Okay, now the thing is, uh, a lot of people think that the Higgs boson and the Higgs field are the same thing. They're not. Um, let me give you an analogy. If you think about, uh, they talk about these things called electromagnetic fields. Right? The, the idea is that uh, in physics we like to think about there's an electromagnetic field kind of permeating all space, and when you have a photon of light, it's like a, it's what we call a quantization of that field. Uh, another way of thinking of it is like this. Uh, I like this way better, actually. Uh, not so physics-y, a little more accessible. Imagine you have a big pool of water, like a swimming pool, okay? Uh, that water permeates the entire pool. But if you wanted to quantize things with that water, you could quantize it in the context of looking at individual water molecules, right? So that, that whole big field, if you will, of water is made of individual little quantized molecules. Think of the Higgs field and the Higgs boson kind of the same way. The Higgs field is something that would, as far as we know, permeate all of space-time. Okay? And what happens is the, the smallest quantization, the smallest piece of the Higgs field is a Higgs boson, okay? just like the smallest piece of that big pool of water is a water molecule. And when these various fundamental particles interact with the Higgs field, then they exhibit mass. Um, let me give you a way of thinking of how that mechanism, sometimes called the Higgs mechanism, might work. Okay, so I'm giving a lecture on basic or fundamental particle physics here. Okay. Um, and I'm not really that famous. I mean, I can draw a nice crowd and, and everything, but, you know, I'm just... But in the grand scheme of things, I'm kind of a regular schlub. So, you know, when I walk in the door, a few people come over to me and they say hi and shake my hand, and I can, I can relatively easily move through the room and get to where I want to go. Okay? I'll get to your question in just a second. Um, now, let's suppose somebody who's like a really good physicist, uh, astrophysicist, Neil deGrasse Tyson, okay? Let's suppose he walks in the door. Well, you guys know who Neil deGrasse Tyson is, right? Please say yes. Okay. If Neil deGrasse Tyson walks in the door, I'm going to shut up and like throw down the microphone, and I'm going to run over to him, and pretty much everybody else in the room who knows who he is will run over to him too, right? So if he wanted to get across the room, he would have a very difficult time moving across the room, right? Whereas me, I'm just kind of, yeah, right? So in that analogy, you guys are all like Higgs bosons. And the, the mass collection of you all represents the Higgs field, okay? And I would be like a low mass particle, like a lowly electron, for example, and I would come in and I wouldn't really interact with many of you. So I could, I wouldn't have much mass, so to speak, so I could move pretty freely. But then a high mass particle, like Neil deGrasse Tyson, walks in the door and suddenly, whoosh, you know, you all interact, and he interacts with you all quite heavily, and then he's going to have a hard time making his way through this Higgs field. Does that kind of make sense? Okay, you can also think of it in the water analogy. You can kind of think like low mass particles are like uh, Barracuda. They're very streamlined. They'll, they'll slide through the water pretty easily. Whereas if you get, uh, you know, a, a, a big clunky human that's not very streamlined, they kind of swim in a clumsy way, slowly through the water. Okay, so... Those are some analogies that hopefully will help you uh, make sense of this. Oh, and, and then they have another interesting twist, and I'll get to the question in the back. You have another interesting twist where some particles don't have any mass at all. Like, for example, one of the particles that doesn't have any mass is a photon. Photons are supposed to be massless. Uh, in the swimming pool analogy, right, the photons don't get in the water at all. They're just not interacting at all with the Higgs field. And we're not sure exactly why that is. 
Okay. Uh, there was a question in the back. Yeah. Fire away. You know, the thing is, is you keep mentioning Higgs, and you know you haven't said anything about Higgs personally. I, I'm looking at here his first name is Peter. He's at the University of Manchester, England. What the fuck? He uh, reluctantly yeah, for the allowed his yeah. name to be used. Uh, so there's a question the coming. You know, moderator. And what about? Uh, this is not how about giving us from perspective as laymen and what you're really Would getting? Could you please at? hold that to uh, question and answer period? No, he said he asked questions as it went along. No, okay, but, but what's, the, what's the actual question again? There is no question. There is no question. There is no question. Why don't you say his name is not Peter? No, it's Mr. Higgs. Oh, okay. Well, the okay. question is, I'm confused. Yeah, we'll have the question created afterwards. And, uh, I mean, if, it, if it's a question you need immediate clarification on, that you can ask it now. But if, if it's a deeper question like that, wait till you say something about Higgs. Let him give his theory. Let him do what he wants. Yeah, yeah. It, that's it. The Higgs is the, the guy who proposed this theory in the beginning, back in the 1960s. So that's all I can all tell. All right. I, I don't know. I don't know anything about the man. I've never met him, so I couldn't say anything. Like that. And it's not relevant. Yeah. He'll be speaking. Okay. So the. Uh, Thank you. So we. I spent some time talking about fundamental particle physics, right? And then I just spent a little while uh, going on about the the Higgs boson and the Higgs field and how all this sort of is supposed to tie together. So how do uh, how do particle accelerators work into this? Okay. Um, this is a, an aerial shot of the Large Hadron Collider, the LHC, uh, at CERN in uh, Switzerland, uh, and well, part of it's in France as well. Uh, this is the largest man-made machine on Earth, as far as I know. Uh, it's a particle accelerator. This, this particle accelerating ring. Uh, is 17 miles in circumference, uh, so it dwarfs Fermilab's Tevatron down the road, which I believe is only four miles in circumference. Um, and the way that the Large Hadron Collider works is it fires counter-rotating beams of protons at each other and basically slams them together. That's essentially what it does. And, and when it slams them together, uh, it creates, uh, well, a mess, <laughs> uh, a very wonderful mess that uh, particle physicists love to look at and try to figure out what's going on uh, at deeper levels of, uh, of physics based upon this mess, right? So it's kind of like it's kind of like the analogy I like to make is you, you get, you know, one way you can figure out how a car works is to take it to the mechanic, you know, open it up, and you know. You know, very, very gently take apart the engine and see what parts do what and kind of put all that together, right? Unfortunately, with fundamental particle physics, we don't have that option, right? So we have to go with option two, which would be like taking a couple of cars and just crashing them into each other and then watching all the pieces fly off and saying, oh, hey, that's what, that's what that does. And so that's kind of what particle physicists do. That's kind of like their only option. And to give you an idea of scale here, you can look at this lower, uh, lower left-hand picture. This is one of the main detectors on the LHC. I can't remember if this is if this is the Atlas detector or not. Uh, but this is one of the main detectors. And to give you an idea of scale, if you look, if you follow my laser pointer here, this right here is a person. Okay, that, that's, that's a person. Now, uh, I know, just as a quick aside, I know that uh, years ago when, when the LHC was being built and uh, uh, coming close to being turned on, there were some people who were I don't know, worried that it might create a black hole that would swallow the earth and sure. kill us all. And uh, last I checked, I'm still here, so that 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 one's uh, that one's kind of been proven wrong. Uh, but if you really want me to go into that, you have to ask me later because that's an that's an entirely different discussion. Uh, I would say that that whole thing is bad physics, but that would imply that there was actually any physics behind it to begin with. So uh, it's basically like no physics. Now. Let me give you a little primer on the way particle accelerators do their thing. Um, particle accelerators, I like to think of particle accelerators as microscopes. Okay, They're microscopes. They're microscopes that allow you to look down to extraordinarily small size scales. See, because that's, that's what microscopes normally do. But microscopes, the normal microscopes that we're used to using, maybe when we were in biology class or, or whatever, they're optical microscopes. And the limit, the limiting factor on how 
deeply you can see with a microscope has to do with the wavelength of the light. Let me put it to you this way. Um, let's suppose that you have a touchpad phone, right? If you have a touchpad phone and you're attempting to uh, dial a number, imagine that uh, somebody has uh, taped all of your fingers together, right? So you don't have fingers, you just got like this big mint for your hand, right? And now you have to try and dial a number and you're trying to dial a number by mashing the pad, the, 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 the buttons with your hand like this. And you're not going to hit any one button, you're just going to like smush your hand into a bunch of buttons. Imagine that your hand taped together like that, that's very long wavelengths of light. Okay, very long wavelengths of light uh, that can't, you can't see what's going on, quote unquote, you can't, you can't resolve individual buttons. But if you get the tape away and use a single finger, shorter wavelengths of light, you can now touch individual buttons. Well, the problem is optical light uh, can only get you so far because optical light has a lower wavelength range of uh, 400 nanometers. Okay, that's what we call violet light. Um, and so that's why you can only see to a certain point with optical microscopes. If you want to get down and start looking at the nuclei of atoms, and you want to start looking at even deeper than that, and start looking at quarks and, and stuff like this, you have to go to extraordinarily small size scales. So that means extraordinarily small wavelengths. Right? So you need to have an even finer, finer finger, so to speak. And optical microscopes can't do that. So. Let me explain here a little bit. I know this is a really wordy slide, but I'll try to break it down as simple as possible. Okay. If you have a really energetic collision between particles, then what you can do is you can generate out of that collision, out of the, out of, out of the stuff that flies out of that collision, you can generate other particles. And the mass of those particles that you can generate depends upon how much energy you throw into the collision to begin with. This is related to E equals MC squared. Okay, Einstein's mass energy equivalence relationship. That's supposed to be a square, the formatting got goofy. <laughs> now, it ends up that even though I'm talking about particles, right, I've been saying the word particle the whole time, there is a phenomena in quantum physics, because now we are in the realm of quantum physics and we're very small, uh, called wave-particle duality. Right? We talk about photons of light. Right? We talk about these little particles of light called photons. <coughs> but light can also be understood as a wave. Okay. Uh, well, it ends up that the idea of wave-particle duality applies to things like electrons and protons and quarks as well. We call electrons and protons and quarks particles for the most part, but they also exhibit wave-like properties. So the interesting thing about this is, when you get these higher and higher energy collisions through a calculation of what's called the de Broglie wavelength, uh, this formatting got strange, but it ends up that the wavelength of the uh, particle is inversely proportional to its energy. Right, so the higher and higher energy collisions you have, you're generating shorter and shorter wavelength particles, and when you generate shorter and shorter wavelength particles, that sharpens your fingers, so to speak, and you can see more and more detail at smaller size scales. Does that make sense? That's the, that's the basic idea. That's why we have to have these humongous machines that suck up so much power, right? Because we have to be able to hit those energy levels to get down to these extraordinarily small wavelengths in order to peer really, really deep into the structure of subatomic particles and so on. Now, turning on a particle accelerator is not like flipping a light switch. <laughs> okay, uh, it is an extremely complicated process. So I'll make another analogy here. This is a picture of all of the CERN accelerators. Uh, the Large Hadron Collider. A lot of people have a misconception that CERN and the Large Hadron Collider are synonymous. They're not. CERN is the entire facility. The Large Hadron Collider is just the biggest accelerator. It's the biggest ring of, of, of that facility. There are other accelerators. And what I want you to think of here, when you look at this, is I want you to think of like a car that in order to speed up to highway speeds, it has to go through many gears, right? You don't go straight to fifth gear, do you? You start at first gear, and you rev up to the second gear, and then you rev up to third, and so on and so forth. So this is kind of like that, right? So the, the, you have two proton beams, and you generate these guys uh, at, at, the, uh, at the generation sites, and they travel through a, uh, a linear accelerator, so that's kind of like first gear, and they get thrown into booster rings where they're sped up, okay, that's like second gear, and then they're thrown into other 
boosters are sped up even more. And eventually, after you go through this process uh, three or four times, then they get fired into the Large Hadron Collider, which is this big ring. This is the ring that's 17 miles in circumference. Okay, And as they go up those gears, so to speak, from, from first gear down here up to fifth gear, the particles, the protons that are flying through the machine, uh, acquire more and more energy. Remember, that's what you want. You want them to get more and more energy so that you can eventually get those smaller de Broglie wavelengths to get that resolution and peer down into very small size scales. Now, oops. What this does is this basically shows you the five primary, uh, five primary accelerators, a linear accelerator and then four uh, circular accelerators, and then the main ring, of course, is the last one. And let me kind of make sense of some of these numbers here, okay? Uh, you start off with no energy, right, because the protons are at rest. Then you boost them up to 50 MeV in the first ring, and boost them up to 1.4 giga electron volts in the next ring, and all the way up to the Large Hadron Collider, where once you get it running at full, at full capacity, the each, each beam of protons that's moving along has what's called 7 tera electron volts. Now let me put some context in these numbers. Uh, if you think about uh, memory storage in your, in your computer, um, mega is a million, right? Uh, giga is a thousand times that, so that's a billion. Tera is a thousand times a billion, so uh, you're talking about a trillion. Now, an electron volt is a unit of energy. Uh, and this sounds like a really humongous amount of energy, and on subatomic particle scales, it is. It's a very big amount of energy on subatomic particle scales. But in the size scale we're used to living in, believe it or not, this is this. If you have like a glob of protons that've got seven tera electron volts this way, and a glob of protons with seven tera electron volts this way, and so they collide with fourteen tera electron volts. Um, if you have that. Uh, in our everyday size scale, that's kind of like a couple of mosquitoes going plunk. Okay, so that's one of the reasons this isn't going to make a black hole that's going to kill us all. <laughs> okay, so again, that's another talk. Um, but on subatomic particle scales, that's a humongous amount of energy. Okay, and then you can get all kinds of wild stuff coming out of that. Yeah, quick question. Yeah. How are these figures related to the, the circumference of the various rings? Do, you, do, do the particles go around only once in each ring, or can you do it no. multiple times? No, they usually go around multiple times, and uh, they go through a process called boosting as they go around multiple times. So, um, and I'm not I'm not an engineer that works on particle accelerators, so I can't give you all the details. But basically, what happens is, um, as they go around, they get kicked up to higher and higher speeds, uh, and they have to be careful about that because if you think about cars going around a around a curved track, the faster and faster the cars go, the harder and harder it is for them to make the turns. Right, and so it, it's very complicated because if you get these things going faster and faster, and you don't have the magnetic fields necessary to turn them, then the particle beam just slams into the the wall of the accelerator, and you don't get anything. You don't you don't get an experiment. So, um, but when I talk about these are called boosters, well, that's synchrotron synchrotron boosters. That's what they do. So it kicks around, and this in physics terminology, this is called resonance. Is what this is called. Uh, it's kind of like uh, if you got a kid on a swing, you give them a periodic push to make them go higher and higher. It's the same kind of idea as if you push, and you push not once but twice each cycle around the ring to speed them up faster and faster. How long does it take for a particle starting out from zero to get up to the seven terabolts? Right. Ooh. Uh, a few seconds or more? Yeah, I don't. I'm not, I'm not sure about that question. I mean, you're talking about actually traveling the distance along the the path, or are you talking about how long does it take to turn this whole thing on? Uh, how long does it take to if you you know enter a particle in there, it starts to you know. Oh, slow. I would just say maybe. Whoops. I would just say a few seconds tops. Maybe not even that. Um, now that's a different question than how much time does it take to get the whole machine revved up to top capacity, because like I say. This isn't like flipping a light switch. I mean, first you got to run this, and then you got to make sure everything's fine. Then you got to turn this guy on, make sure everything's fine. And so that that takes actually quite a long time in order to turn it on and get it running to full capacity. It actually, the process takes months. Yeah. Now let me just mention something over here. Um, you may notice that there seems to be a discrepancy between 
the maximum velocity of the particles and over here, uh, the energies. Um, and you notice that we never quite get to the speed of light. Well, that's because of relativity theory. Um, it ends up that the faster and faster these particles go, like any particles, as they approach the speed of light, it becomes harder and harder to push them even faster. It becomes harder to accelerate them even faster. Uh, if you really want to make a, a physicist rage face, that tell, say, tell them that this means that the mass of the particle is increasing. Oh, that's actually not what's going on. Uh, but that's just a technical quibble. Um, a lot of people think of this like the particles become more massive. Uh, but in reality, it's just that they're getting harder to accelerate. Uh, and this is one of the other reasons why it requires so much energy. Because if you're, if you're pushing these protons faster and faster and faster, it requires more and more energy to get them to go faster than that. Uh, so that means you got to suck up more juice. <coughs> now, since I'm asking that question why there's so much energy needed, let's address it. Um, let me move my screen over just a touch. There we go. Now, in order to, uh, in order to generate the Higgs boson, it requires a great deal of energy for multiple reasons. First of all, don't forget that when I talked about the idea of smashing these things together, um, you, you, you have to have a lot of energy going in to smash them together to generate a particle. Well, what happens is when the Higgs boson, well, theoretically, right, this is theoretical, it was theoretically predicted by Peter Higgs' theory from the 1960s that if the Higgs boson did exist, that it would have a mass somewhere in this range, 125 to 127 giga electron volts divided by C squared. That's just a physicist's way of measuring mass. Now, that means uh, that you have to have a certain minimum amount of energy going into the collision. So well, wait a minute, why are we talking about tera electron volts, which is like a thousand times this? Well, there's a good reason for that. The reason is because not all of the energy would go into creating Higgs boson, theoretically, in, in one of these collisions you would have a lot of other stuff flying out of the collision, too. Uh, you would have, and all of that would require energy, and all of that would carry energy away. Um, in addition, you guys remember we talked about the idea of, you know, protons are going to repel each other, right? So you throw these things at each other very quickly. Are they just going to go, hello, clink? No, they're going to repel each other, right? So if you, get, if you get two protons, you got these two proton beams, and they're firing at each other, as they get close to it together, what are they going to do? They're going to repel away from each other. So you have to overcome that repulsion. It's sometimes referred to as the Coulomb barrier. That in, of, that in and of itself requires a whole bunch of energy in order to smash them together to get the, uh, to get the creation, potentially, of the Higgs boson. So there's a lot of things going to it. So that's, that's another reason why these particle accelerators have to be so huge and powerful and why they're so expensive. Uh, that's a technical thing. Let me skip that. Get right to the fun stuff. Could you go over that stuff? That's so important, though. That five sigma. Okay, you okay? Please oh, wait, I have a request. I have a request to get a little technical here. The five sigma. Okay, I'll go on and, I'll go on and do it. Um, the, the, uh, there was an announcement on July 4th, right? How many of you all heard about the July 4th announcement uh, that came out of CERN? And the July 4th announcement says, hey, we think we found a Higgs boson. Okay, and this is a big deal. Now, you know, you may have heard things coming out of CERN before. It's like, oh, well, we're narrowing the energy range. We think we may have found something that indicates it might be kind of sort of like a Higgs boson and so on. But previous announcements were not uh, met with the adulation in the particle physics community that this announcement was. And this graph explains why. Uh, this graph, I'll just try to break it down for you. This, this, this uh, axis right here is a measurement of probability, okay? And the further and further you go down this axis, what you're say, seeing is less and less probability. And this axis on the horizontal axis is a measure of energy scale. Now remember the uh, energy, the energy uh, sort of the mass, the energy level of the uh, Higgs boson was around 125 giga electron volts per C squared, right? Well, that's where this dip is right here. Okay, that's, that's pretty much right where we were expecting to find the Higgs boson mass according to Peter Higgs theory. 
Now, what does all this probability and this Phi Sigma stuff mean? When we talk about sigma, uh, st in terms of statistics, sigma means standard deviation. Uh, and if you talk about, uh, if you make a series of measurements that are kind of randomly scattered, uh, you can expect to get something called a bell curve. Right? So everybody's familiar with the concept of bell curve. When you talk about standard deviation, this means that one standard deviation means that the measurement that you're making is basically within uh, the middle 68% or so of, of, the, of the average measurement. If you talk about two standard deviations, two sigma, that means the measurement you're making is within 95% uh, of the average value. Um, if you get all the way up to, and when we're talking about those percentages, that's what we're talking about with probability. If you get all the way up to five sigma, I can't remember the exact number, I think it's one in five million? Yes. Yeah, I think it's about one in five million. Uh, and uh, that's pretty much where that is. And so what this is showing you is this is data from the Atlas detector, which shows that we get a very powerful energy spike in this experiment. And the probability that this is kind of like a fluke spike, or that this is a spike that was created by something that is not a Higgs boson, is about one in five million. And the, the reason why the five sigma is so important is because this is kind of the gold standard in particle physics. If you get a signal like this, then that means that you've probably found something that's real. If it's a repeatable signal, and it has been repeated. Okay, so that's why this is a big deal. So a little bit technical, but is that, is that good for you? Okay, great. All right, so now let's get to the fun. No, this is all fun for me, but I don't know. But, this, but I think this is going to be really fun right here. Oh, so. God, he's a cop. Okay, I don't know if you can see this, but I put this in just for giggles. Because something that makes me twitch in not-so-funny ways is when people call the Higgs boson the God particle. Why? Uh, beyond the philosophical and theological implications of mixing up a hard science like physics with, uh, you know, the idea of God and religion and everything. Beyond that, um, it, it also muddies the issue a lot in my mind. So I put this graphic in here in case you can't read it, I'll read it to you. We have a cat that's, you know, very smart looking cat with a bow tie and glasses, and it says, every time a journalist says God particle, Schrodinger maybe kills a kitten. Okay. <laughs> now, some people ask me the question, well, where did this whole God particle thing come from? And there's a lot of people that make a lot out of the God particle language. There are people that say, if we find the God particle, the Higgs boson, then it means it's the end of physics. You know, there's nothing left to discover. Horseshit. <laughs> come to, I'll come to that later, why, that's, why that is horseshit later. Uh, and then there are people who say, oh, well, if we find the Higgs boson, then it proves the existence of God. Okay, whatever makes you feel better. Uh, but people wonder where the whole moniker God particle came from. Here's where it came from. There was a physicist, a theoretical physicist by the name of Leon Lederman. Okay. He's still around. He's still around. He's not running Fermi Lab anymore, but he's still around. And I can't remember when this was. I think it was back in the 1980s. He was, he was writing a book about the Higgs boson and, and, and Peter Higgs theory and all this stuff. And he, want, he wrote it as a popular book, right? He wasn't writing it as a technical book for other physicists to read. He just wanted to kind of popularize particle physics. So he wanted the book to have a catchy name. So he called it The God Particle. That was the title of the book, The God Particle. <laughs> because he figured that would catch people's attention, they would buy the book, and, and so on. And he did, and that's what happened. Unfortunately, that moniker stuck, right? So he, he did that so that the publishers would be able to sell the book. Uh, and actually, when somebody interviewed him about the whole God particle thing, he, he said this. This is a direct quote from Leon Letterman, the guy who came up with the title of the God particle. He said, the publisher wouldn't let us call it the goddamn particle. <laughs> Though that might be a more appropriate title, given its villainous nature and the expense that it's causing to find it. So <laughs> I just had to throw that one in there. That's little weird. historical reference. Now, as to this question, right, is this the end of physics? I said that's horseshit. Here's why it's horseshit. Because there are more questions. I mean, the, the people at CERN aren't going, oh, hey, we found it, we're done. Okay, pack up, let's go home. <laughs> no, there's so many more questions. I mean, 
think about it. First of all, there is a real question. <coughs> There's a real question as to whether or not what the particle that was discovered was the Higgs boson. Now, let me clarify what I mean by that. Is it the Higgs boson? What do you mean the Higgs boson? Isn't there just one? Well, no, actually. The standard model of particle physics that we have, that I showed you earlier in the talk, that predicts a specific kind of Higgs boson. But there are other particles that could behave very similar to the Higgs boson that could also have been discovered in this interaction of the Large Hadron Collider. So if you actually go and look at the webcast, uh, the announcement, the physicists who are giving the talk were extremely careful to not say, we have found the Higgs boson. But then, of course, the journalists were running and say, hey, they found the God particle. Okay. Well, that's what journalists do sometimes. But the physicists were saying, we have found a Higgs boson-like particle. It exhibits a lot of the properties of the Higgs, but we haven't been able to determine whether or not this is the Higgs boson, which is predicted by Peter Higgs's theory. Even Peter Higgs himself is kind of like, well, yeah, more work needs to be done before we can really nail that down. <coughs> so we really haven't answered the question yet. We, we're coming closer, but they have to parse the data more to figure out whether or not what was discovered was the Higgs boson that's predicted by the standard model of particle physics, or if it's some other kind of particle that's kind of like the Higgs boson. You just understand what I'm talking about? Okay, so that's one question. There's another big question. <coughs> We look out there in the universe. Where does most of the mass come from? We say, well, wait a minute. If this is the Higgs boson, then most of the mass comes from the Higgs boson, right? Because the, the, all these fundamental particles interact with the Higgs field, and that's where the mass comes from, right? Well, yes and no. That's where some of the mass comes from. I mean, if you're talking like protons, neutrons, and electrons, and stuff like that, yeah. But there are these other things out there that you may have heard about. There's this stuff called dark matter, right? Dark matter is supposed to constitute about 25% of the energy content of the universe. We don't know what the dark matter is. We have some ideas of what dark matter is. And as far as we know, the standard model doesn't account for dark matter at all. And so as far as we know, it doesn't fit with the Higgs field at all, or does it? Because Dark matter interacts gravitationally, which means it has to have mass. So if it has mass, maybe there is an interaction with the Higgs field. We don't know. We don't have the answers to those questions. Okay? And even even bigger question, almost three quarters of the energy content of the universe is this weird stuff called dark energy. And if you ask any physicist worth their salt, what is dark energy? If they're honest, they will say, I have no idea. Because we don't, we have no clue what dark energy is. Basically, dark energy is the stuff that's driving the expansion of the universe faster and faster and faster. And we have no clue what that is. So those are completely open questions. Yeah? Yeah, I, while you're talking about all this, and most of us have a hard time getting, I'm thinking most of us have a hard time getting our heads Me too. around the terms. Okay, I have two questions. No, this is one of the Well, is this just a clarification or is it something like a Jobs are hard to come by, right? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll get to exactly that point in a second. So, what I want to know is. If that's how the do next slide. That's the next slide. Say again? The answer to your question is the next slide. Okay. Okay, so I anticipated that one. I'm not psychic. I just, uh, I just knew it was coming somehow. No, I'll, I'll, I'll actually get to that exact question. Yeah, because that's, that's a very pertinent question. Other physics-related questions. Remember the standard model? Electromagnetic force, strong and weak nuclear force, what's missing? Gravity. And so there's an open question there. Well, wait a minute. If, if the Higgs field is responsible partly for, for the mass of particles and massive particles interact gravitationally, but gravity doesn't fit to the standard model, how does all that work? We have no idea. Uh, there's a stuff called antimatter. Um, and we would think, according to our physics theories, that there would be an equal amount of matter and antimatter in the universe, but there's not. There's very little antimatter and there's a whole bunch of matter. Why? No idea. We don't know how the Higgs would interact, how, how the Higgs goes into that at all, if at all. And then there's a deeper question about, is there a way that we can formulate a theory of physics which would unify the four fundamental forces into one? 
see the, the standard model helps to unify electromagnetism and strong and weak nuclear force, but not gravity, so can we put, that's kind of related to the gravity question, can we put these things all together and does the Higgs play a role in that? I, I don't know. So these are all open questions. Okay. Uh, could you repeat, which is it, the matter or the antimatter that has the three quarters of, in the universe? Oh, no, 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 that's dark energy. Dark energy that's is dark energy. three quarters of It's three, uh, three of quarters the of the matter. stuff that makes up the universe is the stuff we call dark energy. The reason why we have evidence for dark energy is because um, basic theories of cosmology and all the evidence that we have suggests that the universe is in a state of expansion. We expected, the physics community, that is, expected that this expansion would be slowing down because of gravity. Right? Gravity, when you throw a ball in the air, gravity's going to slow it down. Well, uh, in the late 90s, we found out exactly the opposite was true. We actually discovered that the expansion rate of the universe was not slowing down, it was speeding up. So that means there has to be some kind of stuff causing that. The name that we give to that stuff is dark energy, and we have no idea what it is. You can call it the cosmological constant, you can call it leprechaun farts for all I know. Can have you no point idea to it in the universe? Say again? Can you point to it in the universe? Uh, no. Oh. We, we can say there's something causing the universe's expansion rate to go up, and dark energy is like this title we give to it. That's, that's, that's it. That's all we got. So that's a huge open question. Thank you. Now, to this gentleman's question right here, which I think is a very relevant question, because, you know, th this, this is not cheap to do. Doing this kind of research is not, is not inexpensive. It costs billions of dollars from many, many countries. And so, you know, there's a lot of people that have hard economic times, right? Uh, some people are looking for work. Um, and so what justifies the budget for this? This is a question that was actually asked of uh, this gentleman, uh, Rolf Dieter here. I think I pronounced that correctly. If anybody here speaks German, please correct me on that. Hoyer, Hoyer. Uh, Rolf, uh, Rolf, Rolf, Rolf Dater Hoyer. He's the director of CERN. And he was uh, he was at the press conference where they were announcing the, the discovery of a Higgs boson-like particle. And uh, one of the reporters asked him a very similar question, right? How, how would you, you know, when you're questioned by people who are in countries that fund CERN. It's not any one country that funds CERN. There are, uh, it's a multinational uh, effort, an international effort. Um, here was his response, in part. Uh, he said in part, he said, look, if there's no fundamental or basic science, then you lose the basis for all applied science. Because everything that is now applied science going towards making technology like lights in the ceiling, this iPad, your car, all of that had its basis in basic fundamental science at some point. He said, and you look around and you see how many things came out of the basic sort of blue sky, you know, why is the sky blue kind of science compared to the applied science. And he says what you have to have is you have to have a balance. He says you've got to get the right balance. And I love this analogy that he made. Let me scoot this over here so you can see it. Love it here. Like it just. Uh, he says you have to have the right balance. He says if you have a sack of corn, you're facing a long winter, do you eat it or do you plant it? Well, the problem is if you eat it, you've eaten your seed corn, you may make it through that winter, but then you're dead the next winter. He says, but if you plant it all, then you're going to starve that winter. He says, you have to have a balance. You have to plant some of it, you have to eat some of it. Um, and he says that this balance between funding fundamental science or not funding fundamental science is what needs to be found. You can't put all your resources into it. He says, but you can't not put any resources into it because then you won't get these discoveries that can lead to other developments. And he made, I, I didn't have the space to put it on here, but he made a, a, a good example in the press conference. He said, there's one, there's one piece of technology which every single one of us use on a regular basis which has become absolutely critical to the world economy that came out as a direct result of work done at CERN. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Silicon semiconductor? Nope. Internet. Internet. HTTP. HTTP, the World Wide Web. Oh, the World Wide Web was invented at CERN. And the reason why it was invented at CERN, ironically, it didn't it didn't it wasn't a directly with, due to particle physics. It's not like it's not like they slammed protons together and said, hey, look, the World Wide Web. No. <laughs> what happened is what happened is that CERN is such a big facility 
that these these physicists said, you know, I'm getting really tired of like having to carry papers from one end of the facility over to another end to, to get messages back and forth. So they came up with this way of communicating information in a very visual and interactive way, and that was the basis of the World Wide Web. Um, and if CERN hadn't been funded, I don't think we would have that. And I don't think any of us can, can look around in our modern society and say that the World Wide Web has not had an impact. Now, whether or not you believe that's a good or a bad impact, well, that's, that's, that's debatable. But it's definitely changed the world as we know it. So, as far as your question, that's how I would, that's how I would address it. I don't know if that's satisfactory to you or not, but there it is. Okay. Okay. Um, my, question, my question would have been, how do I know they're not blowing smoke? Because uh, you said there was a lot of stuff we don't know. So I'm thinking, right. well, money's hard to come by. Yeah. So how do I know they're not sitting around, you know, doing this blowing smoke as a way of trying to justify their existence? Um, that's one of the neat things about science. Uh, scientists, if you uh, if you go to a, a meeting of scientists. Uh, I like to say that it's probably the most diplomatic way you'll ever see people break out brass knuckles. Because one of the things that scientists love to do is disprove each other. I mean, you guys think this is challenging? You know, sure. you get a speaker up here and you're, you're like, you've given them the business. If you go to a professional physics meeting where they're like trying to present results like this, man, they will lay into each other because they, they will ask each other extremely challenging and hard questions and they'll do exactly that. One of the other reasons why we know that this is the, the real deal uh, when you talk about all this kind of physics research is that people will demand to be able to replicate it. Like for example, did you all hear about uh, a, a little over a year ago there was the whole thing about these so-called faster than light neutrinos. Right. Faster than light neutrinos, right? Mm -hmm. Now, when that announcement was made, there were a lot of physicists around the world that said, oh, that's crap. That can't be true. And I won't believe it until I replicate it in my lab, right? which is exactly what they should do, because that's a really extraordinary claim to make. And when other labs tried to replicate it, they weren't able to. And then when they really looked into it, they found that the original research was flawed because of uh, design, uh, design errors in the experiment. So that whole FDL neutrino thing, out the window. But that's because of the challenging nature from other physicists, because there's that culture of uh, very rigorous debate and, and, and you, know, you know, show me the evidence and I got to see it in my own lab and, and so on. So that's one of the things I really like about science is it's, it's kind of the opposite of just taking it based upon authority. So that's, and that's it. Uh, so now the Higgs boson can take questions. <laughs> I'm going to pass to Michael. I don't know if I can't remember how we do this. So. I got to get a drink. Uh, well, all you need to all do right, is study how to plant corn. Yeah. Oh, Bob Rosenstein. <laughs> silly ass particle. Yeah, uh, one quick question uh, sure. that uh, I've often wondered why they call it the, uh, the boson. Why did Higgs, was Higgs per prediction based on that it was bosonic? Why not? Why yes. was it not fermionic or anionic, I think, which is admixture? The, the theory... What's the evidence for being a boson? P Peter, Peter Higgs's theory, when he when he worked all the mathematics, <laughs> predicts that it's a boson. So that's why it's called the Higgs boson. Can you give us a little qualitative reason why it would be, why it was predicted to be a boson as opposed to a oh. fermionic? No. <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't. Uh, because... Um, is it like it's a force carrier of mass? Well, it is. It, it is well. In that sense, that the bosons. It's are the force it's sort of a force carrier, but not quite. Because the, the thing is, when you when you if you ask the question if it's a force carrier, what force is it carrying? And that's the problem. You see, because the photon the photon carries the electromagnetic force. The the W and Z gauge bosons carry the weak nuclear force, and the gluons carry the strong nuclear force. Gravity's not in this picture at all. So, what force would the Higgs boson be carrying? And, there, as far as we know, there is none. It, it's, it's just kind of like, uh, the only, the best reason I can give you why it's called the Higgs boson is because Peter Higgs's theory predicted that it would have bosonic behavior and not fermionic behavior. That's, that's the best answer I can give. Thank you. Uh, I think we got a question in the back there. Bob? Yeah, um, is there any potential military applications for this? <laughs> yes, uh, of course. Um, uh, 
not that <laughs> I know of. Uh, I assume if you wanted to fire some protons at Martians, you might be able to, but remember on the scale that we're talking about, you know, on subatomic scales, 14 tera electron volts is a lot of energy on subatomic scales, but I mean, remember on our, size, or on our size scales, taking those two proton beams and whacking them into each other is kind of like, you know, mosquitoes going, Ink. so that would be a pretty lame weapon. So, I, if there is an application militarily, I have no clue what it is. Would help us to uh, make more powerful atomic weapons or anything like that? I, that, not that I know of, but then I'm not working at CERN, so I couldn't tell you. All right, so, well, Marilyn Trent. Oh, you mentioned something about the military, and I saw something recently on TV where uh, the um, Al Qaeda was shooting at um, our uh, tanks going by and shooting at the uh, at the gas tanks, and they would explode. And then it showed, I thought it was interesting what you said about liquidity. Um, superfluidity. Superfluidity. Well, I think that this had something to do with it because they developed a spray, some sort of spray that they were spraying the gas tanks with. And when they found out that when they shot a bullet at the gas tank, this fluid attracted it and closed it immediately. And they even showed a bullet hitting it, going through, and the bullet would drop to the bottom of the tank. Um, I, I, I've heard of that. I don't think it has anything to do with superfluidity, and I'll tell you one reason why. Um, you know, in order to create a Bose-Einstein condensate in the context of superfluidity, like I mentioned in the talk, you need to have extremely low temperatures. Mm -hmm. we're, we're talking like just a few degrees above absolute zero. And uh, in, in what you're talking about, there's no like cooling mechanism to do that. So that, that's, that's a different effect. That, I don't think that has anything to do with superfluidity or Bose-Einstein condensates <laughs> that I know of. Uh, yeah. Is there any practical application for this research on and, 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 its, and its applications and how to get the Chicago Cubs to win the World Series. Uh, no, I think that might actually take an act of God. <laughs> <laughs> that would be a God particle. <laughs> there's a God. Right? Yeah. 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 It causes yeah, two protons. Yeah, it has counter-rotating proton beams. Yes. Um, and then, are the protons accelerated in a vacuum? Are they? In yes. A, yes, that's so a great question. Yes, they it, need to be accelerated in a vacuum because it, if they if they don't if they don't accelerate through a vacuum, they'll interact with the atmosphere, and you won't have a proton beam anymore. And then, how do you make the protons hit each other and not miss each other? Actually, most of the time, they do miss each other. Oh. The vast majority, the, okay. you, you actually fire, it's statistics, you fire many, 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 many protons at each other. You're actually, you're actually firing, you're not firing individual protons, you're actually firing big bundles of them. And most of the time, vast majority of the time, they miss. Okay. Because they're so small. Every now and then, if you fire enough of them, you'll get a collision. And it, this it, is it's like just like, it's just like, you know, the, the best analogy I can make is imagine that you and I each have a shotgun that's firing buckshot. And you know we're in Kevlar, so we're not going to kill each other, right? So we keep shooting at each other, and eventually, if we keep shooting at each other enough, then eventually, one of our shotgun pellets from my gun might hit one of the shotgun pellets from your gun. Make sense? Yeah. Uh, Frank yeah. Aguilar. To clarify why uh, the potential of the Large Hadron Collider creating a black hole is so remote, because when we get cosmic rays. These protons have 10 to the 16 times the energy that the Large Hadron Collider right. could have had. So yep. these are coming continuously through ages, and they never created a black hole, so right. there. Yeah, he's referring to naturally occurring uh, particles called cosmic rays. They slam into our atmosphere all the time, and they've been doing so for billions of years, as far as we know. And they are millions and millions and billions, billions of times of more powerful than the Large Hadron Collider. And yeah, we're still here, so I'm not worried about particle accelerators. Makes us very powerful, right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> not in that sense, no. Uh, Evie Rodriguez. This wonderful mess that you were referring to? Yeah. 
for how long does that stick around? How much time do they have ah. to actually measure that before it vanishes or does it vanish? Somewhere around 10 to the minus 20th seconds. Now, you say, wait a minute, so how do they make any measurements? Here's what happens. Um, again, going back to the analogy of the cars, they slam into each other and pieces fly off. What the particle physicists actually do is they look at the pieces that fly off. And so the reason why that detector you saw in that one picture was so big is because they have to completely surround the impact site where every now and then you'll get these collisions because they want to detect everything that comes out. And it's, it's, kind of like they, it's kind of like they take a movie of the collision because, you know, they can't, like, store this stuff. It's not going to hang around for a while. They, they decay into other particles. The Higgs boson, actually, geez, it, it probably sticks around maybe 10 to the minus 25th seconds, and then spews off a bunch of other stuff. And we look at the stuff it spews off, and then we extrapolate back. So it's kind of like when you look at, it's kind of like if you're a forensic scientist and you come along a car wreck scene, um, you have to infer how the cars were moving before they collided, because you weren't there to see it, right? So you have to infer based upon measurements and mathematics, how they were moving before. So it's very much like that, but in a much more messy manner. Okay. Charlie? Yes, sir. Doesn't that appear to be an inherent design flaw? You want to de-engineer an atom. So you take something and you blow it up. You say, well, let's examine the parts that are left after the dust settles. Huh. I mean, what sort of approach to this is... <laughs> I mean, uh, this is a, why don't you take your car, blow it up with a ton of dynamite, and then say, well, let's figure out what a car is. Well, this is, uh, the breeze, this is a spread over this a, mile. Is a kind, this is, a, this is a, 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 a school of philosophy and science. It's called reductionism. And the entire reason why you have a car in the first place is because of reductionism. Because the science that went into understanding all the physics behind what makes your car work is reductionist science. So you wouldn't have a car if we didn't use reductionism in science. I have the most idea though. I mean, the other question I have is why, if you're studying subatomic particles, do you need experimental apparatus that's 17 miles in circumference? <laughs> Uh, you don't have to actually have a, a certain just accelerator. Speed you could, you could, yeah, just to speed it up. But you don't, yeah, but, you, but the specific the design doesn't up, necessarily yeah. have to be circular. Uh, as a matter of fact, there's a next generation particle accelerator that's supposed to be more, that's proposed mm -hmm. to be more powerful than the LHC, and that's a linear accelerator. So it doesn't have to be circular. But the reason why it has to be so big is because, um, is because you have to get it moving really fast to get the energy levels you need to do the science. But because they're moving so fast, it's kind of like, okay, you have a you have a road in front of you, right? And you're traveling along that road, and if you're going really fast along that road, are you gonna be able to make a hairpin turn? No. You're gonna you're gonna be able to make a really wide turn, but not a hairpin turn. That's why it has to be such a big circle. Yes, but they're moving almost the speed of light. Well, relativity theory, right? If they're moving that fast, then you know one way to think of it is they're extraordinarily massive. There's a lot of them too. And there's a lot of them. It's not just one. I think we had another question back there. Uh, Dave, second my question. Let me kind of naive. I don't understand the importance of the discovery of the Higgs boson. The well, we're not sure if it's the Higgs, for example. But if it is, if it does end up being the Higgs, and they have to parse the data somewhere. The reason why it's important is because what it does is it gives us confidence that we're on the right track with the standard model. If it ends up not being the Higgs boson, if we keep looking and we can't find the Higgs boson, to me that's even more interesting. Because that means that this idea that we have underlying all of this physics called the standard model probably needs to be swept away and we've got to come up with something else, which is a real challenge. Um, in a practical sense, you say, okay, well, how is this going to make my iPad better, or how is this going to end world hunger? I, I don't know. But then that goes back to uh, what this gentleman was asking about before, where I responded, you know, you never really know where this kind of blue sky type research ends up, and the potential applications that come out of this kind of fundamental basic research can be vast. Just look at what the World Wide Web did. So. Okay, Bob Matter. Okay, um, let me see if I got this right now. <laughs> um, you 
it, is it more or less the, uh, the like you know molecules are sort of massless until they have this interaction with the with the uh, with the Higgs field, and that's what enables their mass. So, like let's say a, a lead molecule and maybe a uh, helium molecule will sort of be the same uh, minus any you know the absence of uh, Higgs field. But then when the Higgs field's there, all of a sudden that lead molecule has a whole lot more mass than like the helium molecule. I sort of, but I, but I'd say the kind of the way you're putting it is kind of like putting the cart before the horse. Uh, think of it like this. Think of it that the Higgs field is already there. So it's not like we can take the Higgs field away. Okay. Right? So the Higgs field is already there. Okay. And because the Higgs field is there, that's why those things have the mass that they do. Okay, so then that would tell me then that, that, that the, ma the mass, uh, the tremendous pull of the black hole tells me there's, there's got to be a Higgs field out there then, right? Well, yeah, I mean, we're talking the Higgs field is, is something that's proposed to permeate all space. It's, it's everywhere. It's everywhere, right. Uh, now, in case there's any physics types in the room who are thinking, oh, this sounds like the ether, um, it's, it's not technically like the ether because the ether was proposed to exist in order to allow light to propagate. And remember, photons are massless. They don't interact with the Higgs field at all. That's a more technical issue. Uh, but. <laughs> well, let's see. Okay, I'm getting some nods from some physics types, so I think I'm on the right. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I got a bunch of questions, but maybe first off, uh, I don't really know uh, the answer to this one. Um, is there uh, a reasoning by which they eliminated the possibility that this resonance that they've identified as a Higgs cannot be maybe the uh, s uh, smallest mass supersymmetric particle? Uh, I think that's actually one of the things they're looking at. Because remember when I said we don't know if it's the Higgs or a Higgs goes on the light particle? Mm -hmm. I think that's one of the questions they're trying to still figure out. So I don't know the answer to that question. Okay. Uh, when you look at protons, all protons are exactly identical? They all look alike? Yeah, as far as I know, for the most oh. part, unless you're talking about... Unless you're talking about very subtle nuances like, uh, you know, having protons at higher energy levels, which is, uh, but that's, but otherwise fundamentally protons are, you know, two up quarks, one down quark, and the gluon interaction between them. And what, so what does a proton, is it a round sphere? Is it oh, no, 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 no. Um, th this is one of the limitations of our language. Uh, we, we refer to all these things as particles, right. um, and then we refer to them having wave-like properties, but part of the problem with referring to them like that is that saying it's a particle means that it's like this little localized point. Right. Saying that it's a wave means that it's like, you know, mushy and spread out, so how can you have something that's mushy and spread out and localized at the same time? Uh, so that's sort of a limitation on our language. But here's the way I like to think about it. I'll, I'll, admit, I'll give you guys an analogy that one of my old physics professors gave me when I was trying to wrap my idea around my head around the idea of wave particle duality. Uh, imagine that you travel to another planet and you encounter intelligent beings, they're aliens, uh, and the environmental conditions on this planet are such that there's only two states of matter, solids and gases. They have no concept of a liquid. And you have to explain to them what a liquid is like. And you say, well, a liquid is like a solid, and it's also like a gas. Right. But it's not really either one. Uh, a liquid is like a solid in the sense that the molecules are coherent with each other, and they don't become completely disassociated from one another. But it's like a gas in the sense that it's fluid, and it flows, and it will kind of you know, try to fill in any container that you put in it. So in that sense, when we talk about wave particle duality, all these things like photons and protons and all this stuff, they're like particles because they exhibit that behavior. But they're also like waves, but they exhibit that behavior because they exhibit that behavior too. Doesn't necessarily mean they're one or the other. They're kind of something else, but this is the best way we can describe it. So that's what I mean when I say it's a limitation on our language. Okay, Bill has a question. Oh, well, uh, uh, yes, yeah, but, uh, Bob Lichtenberg. Uh, Everybody wants to in Arizona. He's speaking next week about kind of social theory based on physics. Do you have any opinion on that? Yeah, I've never heard of that before in my life. What was it? Well, he, he's a, he says that there's a speaker coming up who's supposed to speak on a social theory of yeah. physics. And we heard like, uh, I 
I don't know what that is. I've never heard of anything like that before. Uh, so in, to be diplomatic about it, I'm going to reserve judgment. Tell him that it's about scabs. All right. Uh, Bob Lichtenberg. Yes, could you please comment about uh, whether or not uh, CERN uh, accelerating particles gets us back in any way to the beginning of the, of the uh, universe? Ah, uh, this is why sometimes people refer to the Large Hadron Collider as the Big Bang Machine. Yeah, it ends up that if you um, if you look at the conditions according to our theories of cosmology of the early universe, like right after the Big Bang, it was an extremely dense, extremely hot environment. So it's technically it's what's called a quark gluon plasma. It ends up that the energy levels that you're dealing with, the energy densities you're dealing with in the Large Hadron Collider, can recreate that environment. And so when you talk about uh, calling the Large Hadron Collider the, quote, Big Bang Machine, the potential's there. They haven't done it yet, but the potential is there that, you, that, this, that this device could be used to make, uh, to recreate the experimental conditions of the very earliest stages of the universe post-Big Bang. And so you could kind of recreate the Big Bang in controlled laboratory conditions and then examine it. So they haven't done that yet, but... I'm excited. All right, Debbie <laughs> Rodriguez. Yeah. Do you have any idea how many people are employed at CERN? Wow. Uh, lots. Uh, many thousands of people are employed at CERN. I don't know the exact number, but I mean, it's not just physicists. I mean, it's not just physicists. It's engineers. It's technicians. It's you know people who push paperwork. It's it's uh, it, it's a huge thing. Uh, I. And people who feed them. Well, yeah. I mean, it, not not only that. I mean, yeah. But you have the, you have like the service sector people that like feed them, and the electricians that give them power, and it, it's 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 huge. It's 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 like a it's like a city. Basically. How's, how's the food there? I've never been. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea. Okay. Um, I'd love to go. Oh, oh, Rhonda. Uh, so when you were explaining this, if I'm correct, you were using Einstein's theories. How does, is there any way that string theory would relate or not relate to this whole thing? That is a really good question. Actually, that's one of the questions I should have put on my slide that says more and more questions. How does string theory, or how could string theory fit in this? Don't know. Don't, don't know. <laughs> um, there are, it, it really depends upon the physicist you ask. There are some physicists and Ironically, the physicists who say yes, there's, string, there's a string theory tie-in, they tend to be string theorists. Uh, and the ones who are extraordinarily skeptical of the string theory tie-in are not string theorists, so go figure. Um, my best answer on that one is I don't know, but I'm really interested in seeing if there is a tie-in. Wes King? Tesla had a way of a lot of Okay, louder please. Tesla had a way of attracting a lot of energy into a point. And if you have a place that's 17 miles in circumference or, you know, um, his experiments in Denver would have drawn energy that is not necessary to buy. It would be free energy. Um, okay, first of all, let, let me disabuse you of the notion of free energy. <laughs> you got to be really careful about that. Uh, free energy, uh, as free energy, as, as the way many people use the term, uh, couldn't possibly be free because it would be in direct violation of what's called the second law of thermodynamics or the law of entropy. Um, the other thing is. Tesla, the work that he did was specifically and exclusively on the electromagnetic force. He did a lot of stuff with electromagnetism. He did absolutely nothing with gravitation. He didn't do anything with the strong weak nuclear force. And, 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 and so he was looking at only at a very specific piece of the standard model. But it wasn't even a standard model in his mind at that time. To bring energy to pay for, we're just talking about as far as create energy to force this, you know, create the force for this. The power... Oh, well, the, the, the best way I can respond to that is if the physicists at CERN thought that there was anything to those particular ideas of Tesla's in terms of getting that, so to speak, free energy, 
they would have been all over. Right here. Because you, you can't, if physicists know about something like that, they're going to use it. Uh, so that, that, to me, is one of the strongest arguments for why that is not necessarily a credible okay. idea. Uh, Tim Bolger, Bob Matter, and then Charlie Paddock, and then Bob. Okay. <laughs> Bob. What can a physicist tell us about the following traits? Upness, downness, strangeness, charm, truth, and beauty. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, this is fun because I, I not only teach physics, but I'm also getting a degree in philosophy. Uh, the up, down, strange... Uh, and I can't remember the other ones you said. Charm, the uptown strange charm, all of that stuff. Truth and beauty. Those are names. That are those are names for quarks. Uh, that goes back to Murray Gellman. You know, he formed he formulated the theory of quantum chromodynamics back in I think 1964. If my memory serves correct, I can't remember that exact year. Uh, and 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 Murray Gellman was reading a lot of stuff about Buddhism at the time. And you know, he, he was reading about, I think, the Eightfold Path of Buddhism or something, and, and, and he somehow got this idea in his head that he should give like eight names to the quarks. And, and I actually was uh, at, a, at a talk he was giving one time where somebody asked him why. And he says, well, really, when you get down to it, I just, I thought these were goofy names, and I figured I'd just throw them on there, and I figured it was my theory so I could get away with it. <laughs> As for truth and beauty, uh, I don't know about truth, but uh, beauty, well, that's my wife. She's waiting at home, so that's all I said. About that. um, a few minutes ago, did you say that protons were massless? No, no, photons. Oh, photons. Photons are massless. Photons were massless. Yeah, photons are massless. So in the analogy I made about the Higgs field being like a big pool of water, and these particles that have mass that kind of, you know, swoosh through the water, the photons are just like dangling around over the water. They're not even interacting with it at all. How's this for an off-the-wall question? Why do some of us turn out attractive and then, then oh, some of us not so? Uh, so uh, I don't know. You're going to have to... <laughs> yeah, I don't know. You're going to have to ask, uh, you're gonna have to ask somebody else about that. I, can't, I don't have a good answer to that one. Uh, Matt, I, I wonder, as you were talking, how is this new discovery that's coming out from CERT impacted... Uh, your teaching and your colleagues' teaching at both the high school and the community college level for physics? Uh, it has definitely focused a lot of attention. Uh, uh, it has definitely focused many of my students' attention. Uh, it, physics teachers have been loving this. Uh, even the even the faster-than-light neutrino thing a year ago, which ended up not panning out, uh, that, that, that got a lot of students talking about stuff. And... Uh, one of the things that I have done is I've actually incorporated some of this some of this fundamental research into my teaching. Like when I talked about Newton's first law and inertia, well, inertia, mass are basically the same thing. Mass is a measure of inertia. I actually had my students uh, do a little reading and, and watch a movie on the Higgs boson. Um, and so, it, and and when I talk about uh, some of these other things, uh, I'm also going to when I talk about uh, conservation of momentum. After Thanksgiving break, I'm going to start my unit on momentum and collisions. I'm going to definitely talk about all this stuff. So that what it is, is it, it shows my students, and I know other teachers are doing this too, it shows our students that, you know, this cutting edge physics research has, it really has to do with the stuff that they're learning right there in the classroom, right? That, that there's a reason why you need to understand these things beyond, you know, your car, building a better iPad or whatever that it does have to do with these really wild, key, fundamental questions that people ask. And, you know, there are always some kids that are like, who well, gives a shit? But then there are a lot of kids that get hooked, they get hooked into science and technology and engineering because of things like this that who wouldn't otherwise be hooked into it. So, not to mention it's just a blast to talk about, even though it's a Saturday night. <laughs> uh, Bernie, and then Charles. Yes, you were talking about super... Validity. I was wondering if it gets any colder in this room, do you think this will make a good lecture? All right, all right, all right. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, Charlie, what's next? 
Let's have real questions. questions. Come on. All right. I presume you know the difference between inductive and deductive approaches to truth. However, right. you yeah, make a premise that they're frank. One full at a time. Yeah, well, years to say that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> God damn it. Frank, one full at a time. All right, there's a difference between inductive and deductive approach to the truth. Now, you posit there's a particle, and you even conduct uh, experiments, and then you don't find it. And then you say, well, I've got to analyze my data. Now, if I say there's a rabbit in my hat, and I don't find one, that's my conclusion is, that how long is this going to go on? Don't you have the results? And you've got the biggest scientific experiment and apparatus on Earth, and yet you don't, what, you don't um, like the results? Well, that? actually, that was, a really, that was a really intense discussion in the particle physics community among men. This is also included in a lot of physicists at CERN. They had this exact discussion. They said, okay, once we get the Large Hadron Collider ramped up to the energy level needed to try to find the Higgs, if we conduct these experiments for a couple of years and we don't find anything, what does that mean? And basically the conclusion from most physicists was this means that we've screwed something majorly up with the standard model and we've got to go back to the drawing board. Um, now, you're going to have some physicists who are going to take the attitude that, oh, we just need to keep looking, we just need to keep looking. But most of the physicists that I have talked to about this are of the former opinion. They're of the opinion that once the Large Hadron Collider got up to these speeds and, you know, after a reasonable amount of time, if they weren't able to find anything, then, okay, that means Peter Higgs's theory is so. But they found something. Still don't quite know if it's exactly what Peter Higgs predicted. They're still parsing that. I think we'll have the answer to that question within a year. Because there's a lot of data to crunch. Doug, yeah, do you, do you know any uh, theory out there that is competing for the Higgs theory as a mechanism for giving mass to uh, particles? Uh, no, but I wouldn't be surprised if there were a competing theory, but I don't know if there is one. Um, rarely, when you come to questions like this, are there is there just one uh, kind of theory? I can't remember if there's others or not on this specific question, but I wouldn't be surprised if there were. All right, Frank? Yeah, for clarification, I don't know if people understand that this large circumference is composed of straight segments where the particles go in straight way, and then you have the uh, magnetic uh, magnets trying to force them into a different direction, and so there are segments. And my question, uh, particularly is, or, or what I understand it is that the closer the circle, the more energy you need to bring these pieces, these particles around the circle. That's why the circle has to be very big. So right, you have yeah, that, that's part of it. If, if, so, if, you had a, if you had a tighter circle, but the, you'd have to have stronger magnets. Yeah, but the question that I have is when you do change the direction of the particles, in this case, protons, uh, what happened? What energy they emit? Right. Uh, this is why you, you may have seen up there, they're called synchrotron boosters. Right, because when you, what he's getting at is, uh, he's getting at the fact that when you take charged particles and you curve them, they actually emit energy. This is another reason you have to have the boosting mechanism to keep them, to keep boosting them up to higher and higher speeds. Partly because you need to hit that energy level in order to have the interaction necessary to produce, say, the, the, all the stuff you're examining. But the other reason is when you turn them in the first place, uh, they're going to emit energy and they're going to slow down a little bit, so you have to boost them back up to speed. So that, that's what he's getting at. And I don't know, I, I can't remember, did I answer your question? Well, no, I wanted to clarify for people. Oh, right. that that's why... And, that, and that's, a good, that's another so good point. And the, and the other thing that that's a question is that uh, I read that somehow they're beginning to think that the quarks may not be fundamental parts. I have heard about that. Um, I don't quite know what to make of that idea yet. I'm not sure where I stand on that idea about whether quarks are fundamental or whether there's something that makes up quarks. Uh, I got to look at that some more, but that is an interesting. So question. it's not the end of physics yet. Oh, sure. no. Not by any means. Yeah. Okay. 
Let's get through a bottle, Frank. Let's get, let's get through it. They want to do this thing. Ask uh, Matt to stand here for quite a while, and I think that it's about time that we move to our right. rebuttal period. We're just uneducated, Charlie. How many people have so what's in the Bible? ideas, <laughs> questions, whatever, uh, to uh, ask uh, or put here? Let's see. One, two, three, four, five, uh, six, seven, eight. Eight? No, there's Only more. Eight of us? No, there'll be more. There'll be, there'll be, there'll be more. <laughs> Go about five minutes. All right. Four minutes. Four minutes. Four or five minutes. Uh, four or five minutes. Uh, are you keeping time? Uh, I could. I could. Uh, not reliable anymore. Um, I'll. Decades. I can keep time. I've got stuff. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, until until I get back from what I need to do. Oh, we'll, we'll keep time back here, don't worry. We got it. Go ahead. Oh, you got a yeah, I got one on my phone, so don't worry. Joe Mayer. Oh. All right. Let's get it up. Light bulb like that. These guys. I want to thank our speaker. It was a wonderful talk. His analogies were just, just amazing. I really appreciated them. Thank you very much. Um, to answer Charlie's question on why is it taking so long, uh, because it does. Uh, new instrumentation, new theories pop up all the time. It took us uh, uh, from the first beginnings of the concept of planets around other stars in 1600, voiced by Giordano Bruno. It, uh, it took until 1985 for someone to come up with the first idea of an ex exoplanet and data to support that. It was eventually proved wrong, of course, because the uh, astrophysicists who did that did not take into account the motion of the center of gravity of the Earth moon system around the sun when he made his calculations. Um, smoke and mirrors. I don't see my smoke and mirrors uh, critic out there. Uh, um, as Brother Lowry showed, there's a lot of uh, uh, honesty and integrity in the scientific community, maybe not because of the volition of the scientist, but because he's going to be attacked. I mean, uh, they're going to jump all over him. Cold fusion, marvelous concept. Uh, it was by Pons and Fleischmann, both of whom are dead now, by the way. But the uh, um, evidence for it was pretty good. But they could not replicate the experiment. And the experiment was done all over the world over the next three years. The Department of Defense is still conducting cold fusion experiments, because they would love to have something like that. Um, Exoplanets, uh, again, uh, it, it takes a long time. There's uh, two ways of determining an exoplanet from our present perspective. Um, the Doppler shift of the sun, of the star, moving back and forth as the planet goes around it. Um, that's very difficult to do because it takes a tremendous amount of calculation. We have to consider motions of proper motion of the star, of the earth, the, uh, it, it's, it's incredibly difficult. The newest method is what they call the occultation method, where the planet would move in front of the star and there would be a slight dip in the uh, light output of the star, which could be measured. And uh, the, the plane of the planet's orbit would have to be pretty close to what we see, uh, pretty close to our line of sight, plus or minus maybe 25 or 30 degrees. Um, the faster than light experiment that Matt mentioned, um, the physicists in Italy receiving neutrons from uh, Switzerland were convinced 
because of the timing mechanism that they use, that the neutrinos were arriving much, much faster than uh, the speed of light. By much faster, I mean like 1%. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the fact that the timing mechanism that they used uh, was, was basically inaccurate, as well as some of the uh, experimental apparatus that they were using. Uh, so there's, there's no smoke and mirrors, and they were attacked universally because of the internet. They announced it on plus one. They, 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 uh, uh, the whole world knew of their, uh, within minutes of their announcement, and they <laughs> immediately began to attack them. Um, gravitational waves, I have personal experience with something like that. But there are four physicists in the world who are recognized as uh, superb. Uh, Stephen Hawking, um, good old what's his name, I forget him. Number three <laughs> was, uh, um, uh, I've forgotten his name too. It's okay, time. Of is Matt Lowry. Okay. But, uh, <laughs> um, it was proposed and uh, several years ago that gravitational waves could be detected with an interferometer. Yeah. The, the gravitational wave would, uh, would change the apparent length of the uh, interferometer's leg and therefore give an interference fringe which would cause uh, them to con conclude that a gravitational wave had passed. Um, Kip Thorne is the physicist that I'm speaking of. Um, he gave a talk at the... Uh, Time. Time? Yep. Oh, no. Oh, no. Yep. Yeah, I let you go over, Joe, just because oh. I'm nice. Oh, well. <laughs> I read a book on gravity once. So I couldn't put it down. Yeah, the uh, first law of physics is the conservation of energy. Energy never really dies. It takes on a different material form. The second uh, law of physics is the law of entropy. And energy flows outward from its point of origin until it dissipates. The first law contradicts the second law. Where does all this energy go? Material scientists, dialectical material scientists, say entropy is the dissipation of it. Dissipation of, ener of energy is a byproduct of nuclear fusion, which hydrogen atoms concentrated within the enormously powerful gravitational field of stars are fused together into all other elements. It is a process that goes from lighter to heavier atoms. Created in this process are the elements including oxygen, nitrogen, and carbon, essential to the appearance of life and evolution. If the first law is correct, then matter was always there. It is infinite. When Einstein first saw the Milky Way, he thought it was bigger than what it then what it was not what he, he was not realizing that it was another universe. The further out we look out in space, we see more and more universes because of our uh, our technology, our telescopes. The Big Bang is not the beginning 15 billion years ago. It does not have any age. It is infinite. If we start from number one, we can count forever. Number one is arbitrarily taken from the infinite. Since, since matter is infinite, we are always going to find different forms of matter. The forms are infinite. They can, there can't be any God because God lies outside the matter. God is creation of man and not the opposite. Joseph uh, Dyson, material scientist, wrote that the subject matter of science is endless, that nature in all its parts 
has no beginning and no end, and that the electron is inexhaustible as the atom. Nature is infinite. Hard to follow that one. Yeah. Um, so uh, first, I, I want to say that I am beginning to realize that the problem we have in this country about people understanding uh, not only physics but other sciences is that the schools do not teach uh, to follow a rational thinking step by step by step. People get lost because they are not trained to do that. Um, there is 12 percent of the people that they uh, that they found out in, in California, in Los Angeles, that don't believe that the Earth rotates around the sun, but the sun rotates around the Earth. One percent of American people living in California still believe that the sun rotates around the Earth. Now remember that 400 years before Christ, there was already somebody who found, by deduction, by observing, the use that the Earth rotated around the Sun. And today, at this stage, where we have telescopes, we have binoculars, we have instruments that we can use in everyday situations, uh, we still have people who believe that the Sun rotates around the Earth. Uh, it, it is said. Um, then, uh, when the, the scientists uh, say that everything that they do it in finding more and more about the small particles, the universe, fundamental discoveries. I think that something is missing in there. And what is missing is that we have to start thinking about what is the, where we put our efforts. And, and even though uh, research, uh, as it was explained, if you plant all your seed, you start and if you, if you uh, don't plant any, you start the next winter. So in the same way, when we do research, we have to be very careful that we don't go overboard. I think we have so much industry already. We manufacture so much shit that to finding more ways to have telephones, or have better televisions and all that, it's not going to accumulate into a better uh, society or, or a longer term society and survival. Um, the accelerating universe, uh, we have the fortune, my wife and my son, we were at the University of Chicago when Scientists from all over the world reunited there to discuss the accelerating universe. There were two teams that they found this evidence, and they came to Chicago to present their things and to talk about violent attacks, insults. It was right there in front of us. The scientists were really, really mad with each other. And we were, we were looking at the balls going back and forth. Uh, my son was avoided that because Dr. Lam, one of the scientists at the University of Chicago, uh, opened a, a laboratory for Thomas and he put it in front of a computer and he was teaching him something about the computer. So he didn't witness that. Um, then the other thing is that as far as that we know, we think that some of the particles are fundamental, and, and I have read that there is a question now because of the Large Hadron Collider experiments that they're beginning to think that quarks may not be fundamental. That would be something very interesting if that is true, that we find something under those very small particles. Uh, then there is something that we have to understand, and, and today it was mentioned somewhere, that it was free energy. Uh, there has to be a fundamental understanding of what free energy entitles. There is no perpetual motion machines, there is no free energy, there is no, absolutely, you cannot find any way to create free energy. There is transformations of energy into different kinds, electric energy into uh, motion energy and so on, but uh, there is no free lunch and there is no free energy. Uh, 
30 yeah, seconds. Uh, yeah, God, God is, uh, he, he don't believe that. He, he believes that God is free energy or something. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, oh, and then um, we have the fortune to have the University of Chicago Compton lectures that um, I and some of you attend for many years. And there, uh, slowly Time, but surely, we, we can form a fundamental understanding of this, this uh, physics principle. Time. Okay. So I invite all of you to, to go to the Compton Lectures. They are on Saturdays from 11 to 12, and they have all kinds of different uh, <coughs> topics in there. Yes, uh, I really appreciate the talk uh, on this high level, and I really appreciate uh, the large attendance here. I was very surprised to come to the parking lot how many people were here. I thought, my gosh, all of you are thirsting for knowledge, and indeed you received uh, a good bit of it. Um, Mr. Lowry didn't get into a lot of the technical details about the Higgs mechanism, and I, it's well understood why. Um, when I was, uh, this last week, I decided I'd crack out a few books, and uh, try to look into it so much. Uh, one of the books here uh, actually describes uh, some of the nuts and bolts of how it's done. Uh, they just add a scalar field. They actually have two uh, scalar fields in a duplet, and uh, they have some reasons why they uh, introduce some arbitrary constants. Yeah, they even said arbitrary constants. So you can see that this is actually a fudge, fudging mechanism. How uh, its real reason for introducing it is, is that in the standard model, uh, and Mr. Lowry didn't get into this that much, but uh, because of the fact that um, there was no obvious reason why the um, those uh, uh, bosons that uh, come out in, uh, representing the weak force um, uh, the weak force carriers that they don't have mass, uh, that would mean that the weak force might have an infinite range similar to the electromagnetic force, which Mr. Lowry very Deftly described as having a long range, and you would not really want the weak force to have a long range because then radioactivity would be so prevalent in the Earth that uh, <laughs> we would uh, we would not be here. Everything in our universe would be different if, if the weak force had, was that strong. Um, so they introduced this scalar field, and uh, further down, um, and it's, it's arbitrary. And further down, they get uh, terms that represent the weak force carriers and they're able to uh, show that they're, um, they have a coupling constant and um, that uh, somehow, they, because of the mass here, they're able to fudge this thing. So, uh, But the interesting thing about it is, even though it is just a big old fudge, there might be uh, this evidence uh, uh, for the Higgs particle, which is not the same as the Higgs field. The field is introduced into the Lagrangian of the standard model, and it's... Um, um, as a side light to it, um, there is, and it has been described by Brian Greene um, in the uh, author of the Elegant Universe as being a, a chip off of the Higgs field that results in this large mass um, particle, which if it was, um, if the Higgs, and, the Higgs, and by the way, the uh, reason why the Higgs is a boson uh, is because it is a scalar field that's introduced into the uh, into the fudging mechanism. Uh, that's the real reason why it's a, a, a boson, and it ends up having a spin of zero. But these are technical details which are well beyond the average person, and actually well beyond me, because I'd have to go through a considerable amount of effort to totally understand the mathematics behind this. I'm just trusting the other physicists that they all check each other, and that's another thing that's been brought up, how scientists check each other and, and jump on it if it doesn't work. This apparently is the only mechanism that's known that explains why the mass is imparted to these uh, force carriers. And then as a sidelight, it is imparted to the quarks. Um, now, the, as was brought up very, uh, one thing, one point I wanted to make is that, and uh, Mr. Lowry did bring this up, that the Higgs mechanism only explains the small part of the mass that's in our bodies and in the stars and everything around us, the small part of the mass which is the result of the quarks themselves. The m major part of the mass that is inside us 
is the binding energy of the quarks inside the individual uh, protons and neutrons. The amazing thing about this is that um, although the Higgs mechanism only um, uh, affects the uh, inertial mass, um, as Einstein pointed out and Mach and many other scientists, there's two uh, aspects to mass. One is the gravitational mass and one is the inertial mass, which have been found to be nearly identical to the, to the extent that experiments can uh, determine that. Um, but why are they? This is a great mystery to science. It's also a great mystery as to um, how uh, gravity uh, couples to energy. And so gravity is coupling, uh, supposedly these gravitons, if they exist, are coupling to the individual quarks inside your nuclei. This would bring your head spinning if you think about it too much. They're coupling to the individual quarks that are popping around inside each neutron and proton Time. inside you. They're all, and gravity is also coupling to the binding energy that holds those uh, particles inside your body so that <laughs> you don't all explode. Time. So it is extremely fascinating and a very deep topic. And thank you very much for bringing it to us. I just want to. I just want to mention that I do have a a copy of the God Particle book that our speaker referred to by Leo uh, Lederman. And uh, one of the, one of the nice things I you know I I I had this book when I gave my talk on string theory. You know, is it uh, a theoretical concept of God? And I, but I didn't use it at that time. Um, but the uh, the thing is, uh, is that tonight you know we basically had a long discussion on particle physics, and there's a lot of elements to it. And uh, that quote that he uh, used in his uh, uh, presentation about the the goddamn particle uh, that appears on page 22. Uh, of the, uh, the book that I have in my possession, um, he, uh, <clears throat> he says uh, here, the mysterious Mr. Higgs, the uh, particle physicists are currently setting up uh, such a trap. We're building a tunnel 54 miles in circumference that will contain the twin uh, beams of the superconducting super collider, which we hope to trap our villain. And what a villain, the biggest of all time. This is where we believe a wrath-like presence throughout the universe that is keeping us from understanding the true nature of matter. It's as if something or someone wants to prevent us from attaining the uh, ultimate knowledge. And uh, he says here that the, uh, it uh, comes at a price. Because <coughs> the boson is so central to our state of physics, so crucial to our final understanding, of the structure of matter yet so elusive that I have given a nickname, the guard particle. Why the guard particle? Two reasons. One, the publisher, as he uh, had in the chart, wouldn't call it the goddamn particle, though that might have been more appropriate title given its villainous nature and the expense it's causing. And there are, and the two, there is connection of sorts to another book, a much older one, referencing the Bible. And he's got some humorous passages in here. Uh, he talks about in the preface about a uh, uh, funny thing happened to me on the way to Wachitachi, Waxitachi. Uh, that's where they're building in Texas a, uh, a, a superconducting super collider, SSC. Uh, it's the most powerful uh, particle accelerator and smasher ever built designed to answer our most serious questions. So, uh, <clears throat> And he, in the book, he kind of goes back uh, through the whole history of uh, atomic uh, understanding, knowledge. Uh, he starts uh, our story starts with Democritus, who lived the uh, current coined the term uh, autonomous, which would means too small to see and which cannot be seen, uh, cannot be cut, and proceeded through the centuries into our modern times to explore the accomplishments of Albert Einstein, Enrico Fermi, and others that he's listed here. Uh, now, we kept, uh, one thing I found interesting is that we kept saying CERN, 
But uh, CERN is an acronym. Does anybody understand what the acronym stands for? All right, the CERN is kind of, it's crazy because it's European letters get the reverse. And it, 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 it CERN translated in English stands for European Center for Nuclear Research. So, uh, I, you know, I, I think, you know, that would have been nice, you know, to have some history thrown into this lecture about uh, all these different individuals. Um, the other thing, too, is that uh, in, in the presentation, uh, he threw out a name, uh, De Broglie. So, uh, but his full name is found in the book on page 164, is Prince... Louis Victor de Broglie, and there's a whole section in there about how he uh, contributed to that thing, and, and the book is just filled with it. Uh, I have it checked out from the downtown library. Um, uh, it says, uh, Chicago Tribune says, Letterman's unfailing good humor and knack for story storytelling are especially welcome. Uh, it says here, uh, He's a cross between Stephen Hawking and Garrison Keillor. Uh, the top one from San Francisco Examiner says this book, you'll laugh so hard you won't realize how much you are learning. And uh, the Liberty Library Journal says, a delight to read and absorb far more accessible than most books about contemporary physics. And the best one yet, your time is up. Okay. <laughs> Uh, I just want to say one thing about the, uh, the library number on it. If anybody's interested, it's I got QC 793.5, point B like in uh, Bob 62, L like in Larry 43 2006. So, that's time, good for you guys. Your time is up. All right. All right, well, Matt, thanks again for an excellent uh, presentation. Um, I'm trying to understand this a little bit at a time. I just, this one's taken me a little while to get my head wrapped around my finger. I just keep banging away at it. Eventually, eventually it will make some sense. One thing i got to ask you, though, is this, this little nuclear symbol we always see all the time, this uh, little atom with the, I mean, the nucleus with the protons going around it, I, I heard somewhere that this is really not the scale, that the actual scale of this would be something like if you were standing in a house, the, per, the perimeter, or the, 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 these protons are really flying around, uh, electrons, I mean, much farther away than what you saw, was pictured right, right here. That they're like, you know, on a scale it would be like us standing in a house with them flying around outside. Is that correct? The nucleus was a marble. In the middle of a football field, the electrons would have orbitals. Oh, it's even it's bigger than I a football field. Oh, it's even bigger than I thought. I thought it was like, like a house, but a football field. Wow. Okay. So this, so these little drawings are these. We should, they should put not the scale on here or something. Maybe that's kind of funny. Uh, uh, it's kind of on your mind. Sure. One thing that you're probably wondering: How can I turn this around? Into from physics into economics. Oh, 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 oh. Well, oh, 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 oh. the dismal science, and the, yeah, the dismal science, uh, and that is what I what I can say about that is this: that the economic definition of land is every every naturally occurring phenomena. And that, would, that includes the electromagnetic spectrum. So actually the electromagnetic spectrum would be considered land. That's a naturally occurring phenomenon. And so is water. Water would be considered land as well. And of course, land is land and oil and all, again, all naturally occurring stuff. And sometimes it takes people a while to get their heads around that, to think that, that even water is considered land. Because uh, it's a naturally occurring phenomenon. And here's the thing: all that stuff is made. Uh, the physical stuff, like you know, like you can pick up and touch, made, is made out of molecules. And man has never created a molecule. We cannot create a molecule. We've never created a molecule. All we can do is combine 
and and separate. I'm going to separate that cell phone from that guy's hand and throw it out the window. This thing. And all we can do is combine and you know separate and change molecules, right? We can't we can't actually make anything. And we're more or less on a closed system. Like everything that was here before uh, the presence of man is here now, with the you know on, in our little you know sphere, our little atmosphere. With the exception, I guess you could say, of things that we've sent out into space, you know, into orbit, things we've sent to Mars. But other than those, other than those few other items, everything else is still here. And somebody mentioned the transformation of energy, so we might burn a log or something, and we've. Uh, Got rid of the log, uh, but we got heat from it, and we've got ashes, you know, left over. But all those molecules that were there with the log, they're still in some form, some somewhere or another. seconds. So that's what land has got to do with everything in, econo in economics, and where wealth comes into play is that wealth is the result of the exertion of labor on land. How much, how much time do I have left? No, no. Ten, Ten seconds. seconds. <laughs> no, I have 30 seconds left. Ten uh, seconds. I'm trying to think of another, I had another, I had another physics question, but I can't remember what it is. Oh, I know what it is. Are they still using that uh, accelerator in, in Illinois suburbs anymore? Is that still useful for everything? Yes, sir. Oh, okay. Maybe you can tell us what they're doing with that. Hey, hey, hey. Uh, all right, I don't really have much to say other than I want to thank Matt for coming again and all the time and effort he put into this and trying to explain, um, bring us up to date what's going on in this field of science. I'll be eclectic as usual here. Um, theoretical physics is, is actually in its infancy, let's face it. Um, about a hundred years of research. I think there's been some commendable results certainly here. Uh, I, I, I kind of enjoy, I'm only a dilettante on the subject, I, I kind of enjoyed reading that one book that was the history of E equals MC square, I thought was a, a unique approach to the subject matter here. Uh, like any scientific endeavor, the results perhaps, maybe I'm being too stringent, but they certainly have not been linear. Uh, it's gone in many, many different directions here. Uh, but then again, they're doing, they're feeling their way here. Uh, I'm somewhat singular, some of the, the, the forks they've taken in the road in the field here. I mean, somebody mentioned here the string, string theory. And this, I have to amaze, I'm amazed that this, this thing, this whole discipline is, is steep more so perhaps than other disciplines in theory. And they say, well, it's the same theory, and you think it would fit and work and explain certain things, but then, you know, again, the concept of, well, it works if there's 11 dimensions. Like, like what in the heck are you talking about? <laughs> it works if there's 11 dimensions. You know, I mean, no, we're grounded here and things like that. Now, I mean, Joe tries to apologize for all of this by telling us some stuff about looking for exoplanets and other constellations, which I don't see the relevance of that is. I mean, that's a, you know, I, I personally think we've seen enough planets that we don't need to overdo this. <laughs> I mean, looking for ones in Andromeda or something, you know, is it easy, but do we really need to? <laughs> um, now, I'm sorry your experiment didn't work, and you didn't find your particle, but then again, you've got to, you know, and then, I don't understand this, help, help me out here, I mean, you, you say, well, did the experiment work or not? And you say, well, I'm still analyzing the data. You know, I mean, I come from a little thing in the world of work, you know, they say, well, did you finish this or not? And I said, well, I'm working at it. <laughs> and I'm, yeah. it eludes me, like, why you cannot ascertain the results of this, this endeavor? I mean, this is shrouded in mystery or what? I mean, 
once you're done with it, I don't do this, so, but, you know, I mean, I, I mean, well, um, I think maybe they got to stop a minute, and, yeah, these are theories, and if your theory doesn't work, or doesn't, or if I, you know, inducted it, it, it's a little bit like trying to prove God, and it doesn't work, so you say, well, we're still going to believe in God. No, that isn't how it works. We've got negative results here. Uh, one last thing, though, the internet—that there's no nexus between this this stuff and the internet whatsoever. That's a, a form of communication, which is another world altogether, you know. And um, what do they call it? Thirty Serendipity? seconds. Where something comes about uh, accidentally through another fashion, but I don't think you can attribute it to that. But anyhow, thank you very much. Enjoyed it. Yay. Personally, I think Charlie could be more wrong in the concept of serendipity than I think I would much disagree. It's not serendipity. Oh, no. what, is called, what I call the process of what happened at CERN and the side benefit of the development of HTTP, which is called Hypertext Transfer Protocol, was because the physicists had a problem. They needed to transfer large files of data between one computer system and another without having to either put on a disk or move it from place to place. So they were stored in, in a location and they were trying to find an easier way to use that location. So they would invented a science of computers talking to each other called hypertext transfer protocol. Now that was the fundamental basis for the web and yes it has been found it, but there were other things that had to come into place before the average consumer could use it, namely the browser and a few of the other in place, but this is not to, that could be gone into here in a much later date. My point is in doing this research, we do a lot of things that innovate our economy to move forward, and without basic materials research and other kinds of research, we're not going to be able to solve future problems. Look at the revolution in electronics that's happened in the last 30 years. A direct result of what happened with the NASA moonshot and a lot of the basic research we did there with computers. Silly putty. I will, well, you might call it silly putty, Charlie, but I call it a revolution because when you can put into a country now a basic communications infrastructure within, within almost within a few years and have every member instantly communicating without the need for a lot of massive uh, communications wires being ran on the street but through a cell phone tower, I call that revolutionary. I'd also call revolutionary the fact that we are in, a, in, a, in an age where we can innovate, where we can move forward with science and technology, and I think the more money spent on it is a better way of going about it. Now, Frank, there's one word I have for you. One word. And you know what it's called? Thorium. <laughs> There's a great future, Frank. I have in one thorium. for you, but I will not tell you because it's some polite. <laughs> we learned tonight about fundamental physics and possibly about various types of nuclear and other subatomic particles. I'm just going to say if you guys really want to. I know I'm kind of being flippant about the word to Frank, but take a look at the Thorium Energy Alliance. Take a look at the newer, newer science with liquid fluoride thorium, I mean liquid fluoride salts, and I think you're going to be surprised because you might find an answer to our energy crisis there. Thank you. Ten years ago. Oh, yeah, ten years ago. Well, 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 yeah, we are just totally weird. All this, uh, information material okay. and uh, the current state of physics it's all very very perplexing it's even stranger than we can conceive um, it's the main point I learned tonight among the poly confusion um, about basics um, was that if there is no Higgs boson then physics might be on the totally wrong basis. Wow, that's you know that, that that's major. That's truly major. 
You know, if it's all wrong. You know, because they can't find this, this one thing. Uh, a lot of it's very strange, as I said. And uh, current particle physics is extremely counterintuitive and goes against our everyday world. But, but, but it gets these great results, you know, these, these great effects. Um, so there must be something right to it. Uh, yet, you know, it all depends on this one thing, and uh, that indicates to me there's something wrong with it, especially since they, they can't uh, really find this thing without a lot of double take and all kinds of, uh, um, I don't know, what, what do you call it, um, confusion about the matter, why they can't just be clear and find it or not, or say what the hell they're looking for, anyhow. That's not even clear to me. Um, although it is difficult to understand, I don't have background in physics or math. Um, but I suspect that uh, what we really need very much right now is another Einstein. to come out with a whole new theory, one based on a lot of imagination, and um, the heck with these facts <laughs> and experiments that just go in nowhere. Um, and they're nuts. They sound nuts and prove nutty things, but yet they work. Uh, so I don't know. It's just, just totally bizarre to me. But uh, I do have one final question that I tried to ask during the question period, the last, but time ran on, I guess. But I was wondering what the speaker thinks about the scientific fact that the Big Bang, uh, according to scientists, occurred 13.75 billion years ago. Uh, and before that, there was absolutely nothing. So I was wondering what you, what you think about that, what that implies. Oh, uh, do you accept that as a true fact? Uh, but, uh, I presume you're skeptical because that's the name of your uh, uh, website. Uh, so, but uh, I did enjoy your talk, and uh, you know it's not your fault that we don't we don't know what the hell's going on. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's like looking for exoplanet. All right. Uh, Bill. That's, that's really... Uh, well, it seems we finally have a subject here that doesn't have anything to do with the union. Hey! It's Cobb's got out to the circling again. It's the union of particles. Right. Yeah. Uh, there's no Cobb's there, Bill. And, uh... Does it have anything to do with land value taxation? Yes, it did. Bob. Even if it did have something to do with land, probably defined. <laughs> but anyway, it, it does have something to do with public transportation, and it does have something to do with boondoggles. As I remember when they were trying to get this CERN laboratory out in the northwestern suburbs somewhere. And I went to a number of RTA meetings, and. They were making all kinds of resolutions and stuff to get that thing here. Yeah. Now, there aren't that many people going to be riding public transportation to this thing. And the only thing that I can figure out is there's just an awful lot of boodles flying around somewhere. And they wanted in on it. And that's when they also, when they were doing a, uh, a contest for technology to, uh, for uh, uh, a personal rapid transit system. And the uh, ten entrants, they only mentioned two, and the one that won actually failed. And to go to something else that didn't work, and uh, they had these models of this, these personal rapid transit vehicles in their offices for years. And, they aren't there, they haven't been there for a long time. But anyway, I don't know if I know any more about atomic physics and some particle physics than I did before. It is a very counterintuitive subject. And, uh, I hope that we, I, I wish somebody would come up with a union smasher. Hey, fine. That wasn't a union smasher.
All right. Well, true, true to form, I took I took notes on everything that was said. Whoa! Whoa! And I'm going to try to respond as quickly as I can to oh, as many as points as possible. First of all, here we go. So I'm going to get on my uh, talking fast hat. Here we go. First of all, this upcoming talk on social organization physics. I was reading through the description. Um, call me skeptical. <laughs> uh, I would encourage you to question Mr. Johnson when he gets here about whether or not there is any actual mathematics or experiments behind his supposed physical laws. <laughs> of just talk. I that, that, that's just me. No. Uh, let's see. Uh, why does science take so long? One of the reasons science takes so long is because of the integrity that scientists have where we challenge each other and we fight it out. And the cold fusion example is a perfect example of that. Uh, the faster and light neutrinos is another great example of how science works because uh, scientists are very skeptical of each other and they challenge each other. Uh, laws of thermodynamics are actually not contradictory. The first law of thermodynamics also known as the conservation of energy. The second law of thermodynamics says that uh, as time goes on in a closed system, the, uh, the entropy of a system will increase. What that basically translates into is that more and more energy contained within that system goes into a very specific form, that is, heat energy. So uh, you're not violating conservation of energy, it's just that the energy that you have becomes less and less useful. So that is not actually a contradiction. Uh, and uh, there, are, there are experiments bad, dating all the way back to James Joule in the uh, mid-1800s uh, that proved that heat is just another form of quantifiable energy. Uh, the Big Bang actually did occur at a distinct point in the past, 13.7 billion years ago. We have uh, a lot of lines of evidence that, 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 that show that. Um, if you want to look at those, then you can uh, see a uh, tips recording of my last talk here last year, Life, Universe, and Everything, sort of. God, um, who knows, ask the philosophers and the theologians about that one. <laughs> the universe being infinite, uh, this is an open question. Uh, if you talk about the observable universe, it's not infinite because, well, there are limits to how far out we can see. But depending upon how you define the universe or whether or not you accept various aspects of multiverse theory, uh, that uh, could be infinite. Again, we see that uh, previous talk I gave last year on the life of the universe and everything, sort of. Uh, uh, science education standards and the fact that about 12% of Americans poll believe in some form of geocentrism, that is, that the sun goes around the earth. Uh, believe it or not, this is. Uh, the geocentrist belief actually, among a lot of people, is grounded in certain religious belief. Uh, I know this because uh, there was a time a few years ago when some geocentrists sent to me their little tracks uh, outlining their, quote, theory. And uh, when I read through these tracks, uh, they, they, their arguments basically boiled down to, well, we know that the, earth goes, sorry, that the sun goes around the earth because the Bible says so. <laughs> Good okay. enough for me. Uh, the science lead to too much shit via industry. Uh, I don't know. It depends on how you define shit. Uh, if I, uh, I, I certainly don't think this is shit, um, but some people might. So you that's kind of. If you need to. Yeah, it's, it's, it kind of depends on. It comes depends to on how, how much we invest on that. Yeah, it kind of depends upon how you define shit. Yeah. Uh, are quarks fundamental? That is a really good question. It's an open question as far as I can tell. Who knows? We'll see what happens. Free, the concept of free energy. Please prove it. There may not be a free lunch, but there is a free dinner. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Had to get that in there. Um, scalar fields, duplets, fudging factors, coupling constants, and just trying to make the standard metal model work. Yeah, well, basically, uh, essentially, when you really get down to it, uh, Peter Higgs's work is kind of a big kludge to try to make the standard model work because if it doesn't work, I mean, without the without the Higgs mechanism and all that stuff, the standard model doesn't work at all. Uh, I don't know. I guess a way of thinking of this is that like uh, Higgs's theory is kind of like the duct tape that makes the whole engine run. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, yeah, I'm glad that somebody uh, got up here and talked about the God Particle and uh, the death of the superconducting super collider. In my opinion, uh, that was very tragic uh, for U.S. science. Uh, I remember when I was at uh, Goddard Space Flight Center doing an internship in the summer of 1993 when we got the word about the superconducting super collider uh, funding being cut. 
Mm -hmm. uh, and there are a lot of uh, there are a lot of physicists who think that that in fact put uh, American science and uh, more broadly fundamental particle physics research behind by at least a generation. Mm -hmm. um, somebody mentioned uh, Democritus, right? And uh, I think that's an actually a really good point. Uh, I'm glad somebody mentioned Democritus in a reference to the ancient Greek philosophy. Uh, I think that it's worth uh, knowing more philosophy in order to give a better context to, su context to science. That's why I'm not only a science geek, but I'm also studying philosophy actively. Somebody said it was hard to wrap your head around it all. Join the crowd. I'm right with you, brother. Uh, the scale of atoms and how the picture right here gets it wrong. It's not just the size scale that's wrong in the picture, but the idea that you have uh, these, little, these little electrons orbiting like planets around the nucleus here, that's also wrong. Uh, that's like the kindergarten view of an atom. It's a more accurate view is what's uh, what you often see in uh, chemistry books where they talk about uh, the electron cloud, which is really when you get down to it, the electron cloud structure is a um, is a probability distribution based upon quantum physics. Um, broadening the definition of land to encompass quote all naturally occurring phenomena. <laughs> I gotta, I gotta move on from that. Uh, actually, as far as creating molecules, we have created molecules. At Fermilab, physicists have created matter and antimatter molecules. And hydrogen, they, they, they not only create it, but they store it, um, and they continue to do so. They've been doing it for three decades. Um, this is common practice in particle physics research. Um, make sure you don't confuse chemistry with physics. If you're talking about creating molecules in the context of chemistry, you're right, but chemistry is a subset of physics. Uh, Tevatron still has some uses. Uh, mentioned the antimatter uh, creation, right? That's still that's still going on. Uh, and yes, I really I like the I like the fact that somebody said theoretical physics is in its infancy. Yes, I agree. Uh, we have a huge amount to learn, and it's true that any kind of learning is often highly nonlinear, whether it's fundamental particle physics or in the high school classroom. Uh, string theory. Uh, I think string theory itself is problematic for many reasons, and so I'm actually kind of skeptical of it. One of the biggest reasons I'm skeptical of it, it, has yet, it has, is that it has yet to propose any real experiments uh, to test it out. Uh, so is it science or is it philosophy? Who knows? Uh, I will disagree about particle physics is like the God question. I think it's different from the God question. Uh, that's because one is subject to experiment and empirical analysis, and one is not, depending on how you define God. Uh, do we really need to look for exoplanets or conduct fundamental particle research? Well, do we really need to get together every Saturday night to discuss a variety of weird topics at the College of Complexes? <laughs> Zing. <laughs> Physicists are willing to put it on the line because in science we like to put up or shut up. That's why we have so much challenge among, phys among scientists and physicists. And somebody said, the heck with facts and experiments? Well, hell, we might as well get rid of all science then. Uh, and what came before the Big Bang? We don't know. That's my answer. Uh, and last but not least, somebody was slapping on unions. Hey, I am in a union, and we went on strike earlier this year, and we won. Thank you. Oh, this is an iPad. It's, uh, it's just the notes. Oh, it's just the notes. Oh, 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 oh